what's this? Alright, um, it seems, there we are, we're live on... Alright. Tw uh, Twitch, and there we are on YouTube. Alright, we're both good right there. And people on X, they'll be watching if they wish. Awesome. Right on. Awesome, awesome. Hello everyone, and welcome to the RNG Podcast. And I did a little um, fancy move with my arms. There we are. We're live on. You can't see that. And oh my god, I forgot to mute this. Twitch. Oh no, oh no. And I don't like hearing my voice. Oh no. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I know it's not just me, but don't you hate when you hear yourself on like a recorded device and you go, oh my god, is that what I really sound like? I've gotten used to it. I've, 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 learned, I've learned to live with the mediocrity of my own, my own voice. <laughs> And then people will be like, "Hey, you kind of sound like Seth MacFarlane." I'm, Please don't make it worse. Yeah, I, I could, I could pick up a little bit of a like a little accent to it, but Seth MacFarlane is definitely not what I was thinking. Seth MacFarlane's got more of a deeper voice. I, I mean, he, I, I can, I can go a little deeper on a little there. Deeper, you know. Like <laughs> now, well, now he's now he's just trying to re remind everybody, "Hey, everybody, I'm Seth MacFarlane. I made Family Guy. Do you remember that show? It used to be popular. Yeah, it used to be very funny." <laughs> you want me to say what the deuce? What the deuce? Yeah. Brian. <laughs> uh yeah, Family Guy used to be funny, but now it's it's just okay. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's as terrible as, as some make it out to be. It's, I think American Dad is the superior show and it's it's really because Seth is just doing voices on it. I think that's that's the, the crux of it. Yeah, on on top of that too, it's it's pretty hard to just say like you know family guy is the worst show when the simpsons have taken such a drastic drop off compared to yeah the, the simpsons is like what happens like when a, a tv show gets admitted to a nursing home and you have to you have to you know visit it once once every now and then and you go in and you're like oh homer it's good to see you marge who's that nice young man that came to visit me <laughs> you know exactly. it's, it's 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 dying grandpa is what the simpsons is exactly exactly well everyone i should also uh introduce my guest tonight uh one of my favorite people to interact with uh online because i call him the meme lord because his memes always make me laugh uh mr extra zero how are you doing como estas mi friend <laughs> i am doing muy bien gracias and um, that's that's the extent of my conversational Spanish. That's I'm a terrible Hispanic or half Hispanic. But uh, no, I'm 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 glad to be here. I've had a fun fun day. Uh, my wife and I went to uh, my nephew's third birthday party, so we did a, a lot of family stuff today. We were surrounded by kids and dogs and uh, pizza that we couldn't eat because we're we're both doing forms of keto. Oh, nice. So yeah, we're sitting there surrounded by like 50, 50 uh, pizzas, and everybody's like, hey, eat up, and we're like, I ah, know we, we can't. Because we're we're those people. Yeah, well, right. you can't even just take the like the cheese on top of it like some people do. I, I I could just take the cheese on top of it, but you know, at least we we have our we do a, a date day and a cheat meal yeah. once a week. And uh, originally we're like, yeah, we'll go to Red Robin tomorrow and we'll go see Ghostbusters. And now I'm like, I don't know that I want to see Ghostbusters anymore. <laughs> so, I <laughs> uh, got some angry Canadians showing up in the chat already, saying hi, all the way from Japan. Da -na 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 casual racism <laughs> just casual casual just casual. keeping it casual exactly extra zero has the perfect infomercial voice i i agree he could probably sell some stuff that's for sure i i probably could i mean i i uh offered to do the coffee brand coffee readout for the affiliate affiliate link we have on the on the legion but no i got i got vetoed on that but um, no, I, I did. I did just do a giveaway video uh, over on my channel. So not only am I a meme lord and the producer for the Legion of Memers, I also run an a action figure centric channel called Figure Action. We go live every Thursday and we talk about action figure news and industry stuff. Um, we talk about what we're, we're thinking and feeling on new releases. Uh, it's very Transformers heavy, but we're doing a giveaway of the uh, Haslab Omega Prime. That's a nearly $300 set that Hasbro oh, wow. did as a crowdfunding piece. So I got to do a video going over that. And this coming Thursday, uh, that is going to be March 28th, we're doing the giveaway. So if you're interested in that, if you are a collector, head over to Figure Action Podcast on YouTube, and there's a video with the instructions. Unfortunately, it's only open to folks in the U.S., um, the gentleman, G. Tony, friend of the show, friend of mine, who's providing it for us, so he's going to have it shipped directly from Hasbro, and so we, we got to 
play by their rules. It's going to be a big box, so it's like, well, n none of us are eating that shipping cost. But to circle back, I did do a video uh, where I was selling that figure and, uh, and the giveaway. So check that out if you're interested. Awesome, awesome. That sounds but after really cool, this, man. yeah, I, I I love I love robots, man. I, I I love collecting them. I've it's been a lifelong passion. Everybody's like, when did you start collecting? It's like well, I, I never stopped. I was that like kid that was like, hey, you're getting a little too old for toys. Am I though? <laughs> yeah, that's that's another thing too. It's like uh, with my collecting for video games. I used to play the TCG before this, you know, and. When, when you are into it, any sort of hobby, collecting is kind of like a thing, you know? Yeah. Where it's like that that weird thing where we have like our little monkey brains, like, look at my little shiny collection. And then you got your other little monkey friends who are like, yes, yes, good, yes. <laughs> but everyone who is not into the hobby just looks at you like you are completely a Neanderthal. Like, what what's wrong with yeah. you? <laughs> my wife likes to say, how many Optimus Primes can one person have? And I'm like, well, this one just turns into a loot and rover. Yeah. This one turns into a truck. This one's a train. And this one's a monkey. Yeah. <laughs> so put the, and, and yeah, they're, 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 I do have one that's not Optimus Primal that literally turns into a gorilla. Exactly. It's meant to be Optimus Prime, but it still turns into a, a gorilla. So that, that does exist. That's a real one that I have. Oh, no, I, I had Optimus Primal growing up, too, but I got, yeah. you probably got, like, the nice, cool one. I had just had, like, the shitty one that was, like, I don't know how this one transforms because it was uh, not the original Beast Wars run, but when they went back to Cybertron. Okay, so that was that was the Beast Machines one. Yeah. So you probably had the clear blue one. Yes, I did. The first one to come out. And he had the, the accessory that was supposed to be a shuriken, but it looked like he was flinging a fucking booger. I know. I, I just remember that as a kid. It, that That was... That's going way back. <laughs> and then he had the one feature. He had, like, that clear blue plate on his head that you could move back and see his brains. And it's yes. like, who, who designed this? <laughs> I always thought of, like, Hans Mole Man with that, like, you know, that plate would pop off when you transform him and just imagine him going, oh, no, my brains. And it was, like, a weird one, too, because you had to, like, break him in half to expose the yeah, head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as a kid, I'm like, this is weird. Like, the other Transformers you had, they could, like, work just fine. But then it's like, no, for this one, you got, like break him in half put his arms yeah. become his leg and then you got yeah. his head comes out his ass and then you're like all right we're good to go man and then they did the one later on that was show accurate and they gave him a real ass like he has a pink <laughs> painted baboon ass and everything's like he's a gorilla he shouldn't have that <laughs> and then the, the worst part was the way he transformed the flap that was his ass in beast mode went up against his head so he's like literally like let, resting the back of his head on his ass <laughs> That's, oh, man. That's funny. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it's like, obviously, somebody had, like, a sense of humor. Because I think designing this for kids, how funny would it be if we just, like, made his ass cheeks his, his uh, shoulders in robot mode? <laughs> you know, we, we, would that be good? You know. Yeah. They, it's like, somehow they made it work. And I'm like, this guy made it very overcomplicated to make this guy just become a human robot looking thing. I, I think there are a lot of toy designers back in the day that had sense of humor. Like, there was the Jar Jar Binks lollipop around phantom menace you remember that uh no not really this one this one might it, be eluding me it was jar jar's head and it opened up and his tongue popped out so the kids had to make out with jar jar to eat the lollipop <laughs> and i mean they, they put in a recall for it but i mean by the time they did i mean episode one had already run its course over the summer so it was like you know that's that was like the average shelf life of a, a movie tie-in candy back in the day and then there was the tarzan that had like a chest. He was meant to like beat his chest, and he only did it with one arm. And if you move the arm down, he would still make the motion. And they recalled that, especially because the best part was it wasn't that he just beat his chest. He like went Whoa! <laughs> while he was doing it. So you move, you move the arm down. You can use your imagination to have this man just wailing like a banshee and be beating something below his chest. That's so fucking wild. Ah, so, oh, man. Much yeah. much more innocent time, that's for sure. Uh, it, like, uh, my wife, like, for some reason, she's convinced that this is, like, a real thing. And she's like, I don't know why, but, like, recently, she's like, my stomach's been upset. And all the only thing I could say is, like, oh, man, my stomach is upsetty spaghetti. And I'm like, why is that? She's like, I guess there was a, a doll that she grew up with called uh, I, Betty Spaghetti. I thought it was Betty Spaghetti. Yeah, yeah. that's where it was from. 
and she she told me that. I'm like, what the hell is Betty Spaghetti? I've never even heard of this. Yeah, it was like a bendy doll with like with like braided, like I guess the hair was like made out of pipe cleaners or something. Yeah, it sounds it sounds cheap, but she's just like, oh yeah, my stomach's yeah. upsetty spaghetti. I'm like, stop saying that. It's fucking weird. <laughs> I remember like so many of those weird toy lines too. Like they they used to they had like these weird weird ones where, like um, uh, like the pregnant doll. You remember that? I don't re- remember the pregnant one, but I remember the one where it's like it would piss and shit itself, and it girls had yeah to yeah. Diaper. I remember and those then, commercials because they were nightmare fuel. Remember the um the Cabbage Patch Kids that like would eat. Uh, I was thinking, I, like vaguely. at first we said Betty Spaghetti. I was like, wait, there was a Cabbage Patch Kid that ate, and then like. <laughs> They recalled that because it was like eating little girl's hair. Oh god! <laughs> and they come back and actually like, this cabbage patch kid like sucking on like, some kid's skull. She's like shrieking like a banshee, and the parents are like, "What do we do? Do we cut it?" This this just sounds like a Bill Ingvall skit. I heard him say one time. Do you know who Bill Ingvall is? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you remember when he was talking about like uh, he saw a special for Barbie? No, I don't remember that one. It was like uh, it was. I guess he made a bit about like. Uh, I guess they had a recall on a Barbie or something, and it was because the Barbie had skates that shot up little sparks. <laughs> and he was like, he's like, he's like, I'm just watching the news, and then they're showing this thing, and they're like, this is a harmless doll, right? And he's like, yeah, yeah, it's a Barbie doll. And then she, he's like, and the news reporter is like, well, what happens if the uh, Barbie went through a pool of gasoline or something? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. And the punchline is like, she went in looking like Barbie, and she came out looking like Shania Twain. <laughs> Oh, that I still remember that one. Good jokes can stick with you forever. There was also an epidemic in the early, uh, or I guess the mid '90s too, where people were going and taking the Barbies and removing the voice boxes and putting in other things. Like The Simpsons made a joke about it with the yeah. Malibu Stacy episode, where the little girl goes, "Something's wrong with my Stacy," and it's Spider Man going like, "Did somebody order a web crawler?" <laughs> but people were doing that back in the day, and I'm like, "We need to bring that back." Oh, man, I was too young for that. I don't remember that one, but that sounds hilarious. Uh, yeah. I would I would just get custom voice boxes. I'd make Barbie sound like Tourette's guy. <laughs> oh, God, that's... that's the fuck do you mean, sound. Peter Pan peanut butter alert? <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> Your toothpaste made me feel like shit! <laughs> Dad, I heard she was a lesbian. That <laughs> just means she likes what I like. <laughs> Don't talk shit about Total. Like, so, 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 <laughs> There's a long-legged, pissed-off Puerto Rican man in my front yard. <laughs> uh, but I guess we should start getting this back on track. This is yeah, uh, a gaming, gaming. show. Uh, as you can see, that we are off on a great start here. Already, already having some good time making some fun jokes. Mr. Extra Zero, as I like to always have with people on the show, what is your villain and or hero origin story? What got you into gaming? What got you into youtube and what got you into memeing tell us more well it's uh, we'll start with gaming um i've been a lifelong gamer and uh so i was born in 85 as primarily raised by my grandparents the cool thing about my my grandparents is they were gamers my grandfather um he was a former navy guy uh he worked for uh westinghouse in north of Grumman for a number of years he was very into technology oh, wow. and so i i was basically brought up in a household where he was all about the latest tech, and he loved Intellivision, he loved Atari, he loved ColecoVision, and um, he and, and his sister were both really into, into gaming, and so they had a lot of those early gaming systems, so I grew up uh, primarily playing Intellivision. He, he loved Intellivision, like, uh, um, I think it was at Frog Frog. Um, I can't remember if Phoenix was on Atari or ColecoVision, but Phoenix was one that my, my great aunt loved. Um, Obviously, um, they, they even loved Atari Pac-Man. Like, they, they would be like, yeah, it's different than the arcade one. <laughs> and um, also, my grandmother managed a bowling alley. And back then, I mean, bowling alleys were a big alternative to arcades. So yes. I would go in, you know, she basically would, would watch me throughout the day after school. I'd, I'd, you know, leave school, go to the bowling alley. I'd bowl in the kids' league. And then after that, while, you know, her shift was finishing up, I'd, I'd get to play video games. So... Like video games have just been an, an a, a big intrinsic part of my life, and um, you know, I got a I wow, I I think I because of my uncles and my grandfather, I was I just playing games even literally before I could walk. Um, well, really before I could talk, I I, I beat Super Mario Brothers when I was five years old. Um, I guess you know, 
today they would probably think I was a savant if I could do that. But, uh, you know, I, I just can't ever think of a time in my life where, where gaming wasn't there. And it's to me, it's just as a normal thing of as listening to music or watching TV or going to the movies. Um, so, you know, it's just something I, I never grew out of and uh, never stopped enjoying. Um, I guess how I got into um, to memeing, um, it, it's funny. I've heard people bring up You're the Man Now, Dog, uh, several times. Mm-hmm. And uh, I actually talked about this on another show uh, not too long ago. So uh, I I went into high school in 99, and I was really interested in being a graphic design major. I decided that's what I wanted to do. I got my first computer in uh, for Christmas of 98. And I just was like really, really interested in doing digital art because digital art was starting to pop off then. And I remember there was a guy that came to my high school and showed off Photoshop. And so um, I was like, I want to be able to do that. And I went and I figured out to get it because at the time, like LimeWire wasn't just for stealing music. It was also a place to get software. So I pirated (laughs) Photoshop and got into it. And I remember the very first meme I made was legitimately a, a, I turned the school lunch guy. We had this school lunch guy named Earl and, um, Earl, Earl was, um, Earl was interesting. The only thing he could say was hot lunch. Who's hungry. Mm-hmm. That was all he, all he could say. I don't know what, what his deal was. Uh, all, all I can say is God bless Earl because he was the subject of my first meme. I had a friend who brought a digital camera to school because they were still new at the time. He mm-hmm. sent me the picture of Earl through email. And uh, I made this meme of uh, Earl in uh, Metal Gear Solid. And it just was Metal Gear Solid 2, The Sons of Hungriness. Because we all we had was the title to go off of. And it was like, basically, it was, it was like Earl. And I, I like crudely cop, copied Solid Snake's bandana and put that on him and... Uh, and uh, I, I wish I still had the memes. I'm sure I'd sure I, if I critiqued, I'd be like, "Wow, that's really shitty." Um, <laughs> but, um, I, uh, I I I did that, and I basically had him exclaiming "Hot lunch!" And uh, one of the uh, soldiers on Shadow Moses was about to shoot him because he he gave up his cover. Uh, <laughs> and, and I just kind of rolled with it. I mean, I would I I just got into I was I was doing like legitimate artwork, and then I I just I had so much fun making making things funny and make you know making funny images and making people laugh and then when uh ytmnd came out you're the man now dog uh if you don't if you don't know what that's all about the movie finding forrester sean connery famously says in the trailer you're the man now dog and um (laughs) that became a thing that became like an internet meme and that was before we even really had the word meme i mean we we just thought they were funny images on the internet there was also grimace ate my balls and there were all these ate my balls websites <laughs> I, I mean basically you could just take anything and add ate my balls to it and it was it was funny for the time like tupac shakur ate my balls uh chuck, <laughs> chuck norris ate my balls <laughs> nick carter and shaquille o'neal tag teamed ate my balls um so you know, we would make those images um and then there is a guy i used to be friends with he made a web comic called the good life and it was the shittiest comic I've ever seen in my entire life. And this kid, like, also wanted to be a graphic designer, and he didn't like constructive criticism. So I took the comic. I still have this comic, by the way, or because I still have it in my in my in my email. I, like a buddy of mine rediscovered it, so I emailed it to myself, and we changed the good life to the gay life, and just basically altered every single panel and all the dialogue in it. And we uploaded it to his message board. Like, we made some changes to the comic. We think we made it better under, like, a, a burner account called the Moondike Syndicate. <laughs> oh, my God. He was so pissed. Um, But, yeah, that was, that was like, my – I've been I've been memeing since high school. And, and, you know, with people I know, with people, you know, just randos on the internet. Um, you know, and I, I've been big in the Transformers community for a long time. Uh, and I, I was – I really kind of found my stride in 2017-ish when I just started memeing podcasts. Like, there was one Shattercast Uncut, and they had a, uh, a Facebook page, and I would just listen to the show, and I'd take yeah. funny bits out of context and just make those memes and, you know, memeing friends. And, um, you know, then when Side Schoolers relaunched in, uh, in 
2023 last year, I got discovered by the Legion of Memers because uh, Stuttering Craig was sharing my memes on the show. And, uh, you know, I just, I, I don't know what, what really triggered me to, to start doing them. I guess it was even before Side Squad was relaunched, I would take stuff that Craig was saying out of context and put it into meme form. Mm. And uh, then New, New Green Rocks <clears throat> discovered me through uh, through side scrollers. I mean, he was also memeing them a bit, and he runs the Legion of Memers. They're uh, connected to the, uh, the the Fellowship and the FNT crew, and he brought me in. And, you know, I've been, I've been perpetually online for a very long time, and I have experience running podcasts. So uh, we, we talked a bit, and he rolled the dice on me and made me the producer for the Legion. Um, there we go. I guess that kind of segues into how I got online. Um, you know, I've been, I, I've, I've been heavy in, in the collecting community. I used to write for a site called Palette.tv. Uh, we came up about the same time as like Destructoid and Giant Bomb, and I did some gaming reviews. I did some toy reviews. Some of them are still out there. Uh, if you find me on YouTube, chances are you'll see me 17 years ago reviewing live action Transformers toys. Jesus. Um, but we also did some gaming stuff like that. It's unfortunately not on YouTube anymore. Like we went to the Halo, the Halo Three, and the Halo Reach launches and ODST. Oh wow! Um, I was on the Palletcast for a while, and I just had a lot of fun. I, I think the first podcast I ever did was in 2010, and uh, just talking about gaming, comics, and collecting. And uh, 2017, I, I started getting involved with Transformers podcasts and collecting podcasts. I was on the Realm of Collectors podcast for a while and then had some disagreements with those guys and ended up making my own. That's how Figure Action was born. I um, started that with a couple of my friends, uh, T-Man and, and uh, uh, Parts Former. Then we added a, a couple, a few more guys to it. And um, yeah, I, I guess that's that's just it's kind of kind of uh, the. 50,000 foot view of, of how I got into all this. Yeah, it's, it's still very interesting. It's just, you know, in a relatively short span of time, it seems like you've done so much. And uh, it's so very interesting. It's just, like, it's just, I'm learning so much about you, just like how far back this rabbit hole goes. You know, I just, I just really only know you as the guy who, like, constantly shows uh, Melee James getting raped in every sort of scenario. Yeah, I know. And, and, you know, <laughs> I, I constantly get asked, like, how do you come up with this stuff? Like, the other night, I, I, I just did, you know, James was, was going on a tirade about, you know, shoving stuff in his ass because, like, you know, we've created this lore around the, the Melee Games channel. And, um, you know, the, the guests, I, I love the fact that they use stream elements and you can just kind of come in. And I'm sure one day somebody's going to ruin it for everybody. Yeah. Um, but for the time being, I enjoy that it can come in and, and just create these very, I, I used to be a huge Conan O'Brien fan back oh, when okay. he, you know, when he did, uh, um, the late show. And I, I'm very inspired by like all of the, um, all of the, um, oh, so I'm getting another call on discord. Let me kill that. All right. Um, getting, you know, I'm very inspired by like all the characters that he had on, uh, on, on the show like he had like the masturbating bear pimp bot 2000 <laughs> so i draw a lot of inspiration from what he used to do and i think that's like that was like one of the things that like when i was a teenager really left an impression on me is like creating these zany characters like i had one today like power bottom smithers and of course horny <laughs> and i rate flanders hamas movie bob um you you you, you always play to an audience like you got to know what the people that that you're 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 sharing to or into so you have mm -hmm. to have an understanding and you can't just like kind of come in blind you have to actually know um what the audience likes you know because you, you need to know that it's going to land it's going to resonate and then i just find myself just like going completely off the wall like what has what hasn't been done or you know what's kind of obscure and forgotten about like i did that one meme the other night of um of uh the one man, one jar, but it's the blue saxophone Eminem, and that's like a very inside joke to something going on uh, with the with with his discussion. But I, I just I love that stuff because it's it's like it might be a one off, but it, it, it's like very spur of the moment. It's funny, uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's like kind of like the energy that Conan used to have. He'd be talking about something, and then bam, here comes a a guy in a bear costume with a basketball and a diaper. And they're trying to get him off stage. Like, I love chaos. I love oh, yes, uh, the yes. unexpected. I, I love that stuff. I, I love that. Uh, outrageous. You know, I love outrageous. Yeah, exactly. That's the best way to say it. Because yeah. uh, 
I feel like for a lot of people, uh, I'm kind of like the guy who has that really fucked up sense of humor. And I think mostly it becomes uh, kind of two things. One, I had a really shitty fucked up childhood, so yay child abuse. Mm-hmm. You shaped me into the who I am. But the same. Of- <laughs> so I can respect <laughs> exactly. that. And then the second part is, like, I grew up uh, listening to Opie and Anthony and all those people yeah. all the time. And you want to talk about, like, the things that shape my comedy. Just, like, the crazy over-the-top humor with just that. Uh, the O and A show and all the other comics that let me you to the Jerky Boys at all. Jerky Boys were a little bit uh, before yeah. my time, but I learned I'm, like this is why uh, Fernando, my uh, my buddy, Shred Metal Shred Freak, mm-hmm. uh, I introduced him to all this stuff like the Ron and Fez show and all that. Like he's learning about like you know uh, the bits of my baby is black, a uh, a track porn, and he's and I'm just like look at this stuff. This stuff is like outrageous to look at now but it's so funny to look back on because it's just how fucking crazy it was you know yeah. the legion of skanks also has the best roasts did you ever oh see the one God, where, yes. where uh nick mullen destroyed jamie kilstein yes yes that is, oh, that is like my classic. favorite roast ever i think uh one of my favorite moments uh with Luis j gomez was uh it was on you know what dude podcast mm-hmm. and it uh another comic dan soder do you know you know who dan I, I know dan soder yeah i like dan soder we saw him live but he, this is when he was like first starting out, and he compared Lewis to the the uh, gorilla that could do sign language in Congo, and I fucking lost it because he's just a, he's just, the gorilla's just doing racial slurs in a Lewis voice, and I'm just like dying. And uh, one of the best memories I still have when Fernando and I, uh, I used to be sponsored to play the Pokemon card game, so uh, we took a long uh, trip down south uh, to Illinois right by st louis just outside of it and we're and i introduced him to uh legion of skanks podcast and they're they're making fun of uh lewis's dad being stabbed outside of a 7-eleven and it like changed his and like everyone else's life i'm like this is the comedy i like i like offensive i like crazy i like over the top comedy if like people see me on twitter i am constantly always talking that shit to everyone because it's funny, you know. You, if Did you, you ever listen to Come Town? Oh, I love Come Town. I yeah, I do too. So that, when you're talking about Louis J. Gomez, that was like, I always think about the the one where Nick does Homer getting red pilled, and he's <laughs> explaining it to Marge, and he's like, Marge, I can't do a good Homer voice, but he's like, Marge, I want to be like Louis J. Gomez and do karate in the. Oh, <laughs> uh, it's I I kind of uh, took a little break from listening to that stuff because at work uh, it was like distracting me too much. You probably just bust out laughing. I mean, it's also yeah. it's also kind of it's not the same with with uh, Stav being gone either. Yeah. And fun fun fact, uh, he Stav is actually a childhood friend of my my wife and brother in law. That's that's. But I I crazy. haven't met him. Yeah, they they grew up. They all grew up together. Um, well, so it's like I love to meet the dude i'm sure he'll roast the fuck out of me when it happens i know the funnier that's like another funny thing too i had a friend in high school whose mom was like actual friends with uh billy corgan of smashing pumpkins too because oh shit we grew up around each other rest in peace she was a nice lady mm. you know, sadly she passed away but oh my god i would never want to be on that woman's like bad side she was also crazy <laughs> i just remember one night so the the reason why i bring this up and this is why i learned to fear god with this lady uh we're in the Chicago area, we go to the Aragon Ballroom. So we go see uh, it was Mastodon and Death Clock, you yeah. know. So that was an awesome. I remember night. that tour? Oh, that was an awesome yeah. tour. Um, I'm actually on a promotion, uh, the promotional video for that one because. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, and I just remember like having a ball, like at the time of my life, a guy dressed as Doctor Roxo fucking just falls on me because he was crowd surfing, and we're at the very front, head banging, not paying attention. Did he actually do cocaine though? Maybe it is Chicago, so you don't know. <laughs> And I just remember uh, we were going to Wendy's, like, right after that concert. And, like, uh, the the worker just, like, was, like, giving, uh, like, his mom shit. And then she just, like, full on, like, drives, like, 50 miles out of the drive through parks and is, like, slamming on the door. Like, what the fuck you doing? <laughs> and then they didn't even want to mess with her. And I'm like... I'm like, oh yeah, I, I should not mess with this lady. <laughs> she she's insane. She's doing this in downtown Chicago in the middle of the night. So uh, yeah, it's uh, that's ballsy. Yes, she yeah. she was really ballsy. And the funnier part too was like, I don't know why my friend said this to me. He was like, yeah, my mom got fake tits. I'm like, why are you telling us this? Like like what high schooler is going to do this? So it's like, and then he was like complaining that like, why do you guys keep bringing it up? I'm like, why the fuck did you tell anyone that we're high schoolers? What do you think we're going to do? 
If you tell us that your mom got fake tits, you just gave us like the the it's like the equivalent of the N word yeah, pass. You, We're gonna use it. <laughs> gave us the 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 comedy gold mine right there. You know, you, exactly. You get dunked on. Exactly. I, I mean, it would have been funny if he's like, it's like, well, wait, why did you tell us this? Well, this is why I didn't have a good Christmas. <laughs> no, he, he just like randomly brought it out of the blue. It's just, I think we were like stoned. And it was like one of those things you don't think about when you're high. You're like, ah, oh, yeah, this is funny and thing. But the problem is like your friends are just not high enough to forget about it. Right, exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Memories. Yeah, but. Memories. Yeah. 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 Definitely. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, like I said, comedy is, you know, definitely uh, the theme of the show. And comedy is very subjective. And uh, you can tell that a lot of people online have never had, like, any sort of bad experience in life when even an offensive joke yeah. or even just, like, when you roast them to their face. Like, they just can't handle it. It's like, they can talk right back yeah. to you, but they once you push back, just, like, in the slightest, well, some people now, down. It's like, people are so afraid to, to like, I love comics that make fun of everybody. Oh, yeah. Like, I don't, I don't like the, I don't like Clapter. Like, Clapter, like, from the Ugh. right and the left is the lamest thing. Like, we saw Ryan Long the weekend before last. I fucking love that, dude. He also had, um, uh, uh, J.J. Lieberman from from uh boys cast with him yeah and i i just love the fact that these guys are like tearing into everybody and it's such such a rarity with comedians now they're they're like they're they're very tribal it's not it's not set but i just like when when you can go in and just everybody is free game that's oh, that yeah. is like tops and there's like people that just can't handle it oh anymore. yeah like i said it's just it's i come from that opie and anthony and that yeah. come town legion of skanks like if you can make fun of like your past tragedies, like I always joke with people, it's like, you know, my dad was a raging alcoholic, you know, my mom was got like crazy stuff happening to her in her life, uh, you know, I, I, you got to be able to make fun of yourself. Like there are some people who right. say like I want to be a comic, and it's like, but you can't take criticism. How, like what are you gonna right. do if you bomb? I forget who said it. I think it was Joe Rogan, but he, I think he said like when you're bombing. It's like the equivalent of like your mom watching you suck dick on stage. That's what I think that's what he said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we uh we we went to uh it's I, I go to a lot of comedy shows and uh, funny funny enough before Ryan Long the last one we saw do you know Tony Woods? I've heard the name. I can't remember his work. Yeah, Tony Woods. He's just been he's been around for a long a long time. Um, he uh, I, out outside of his stand up, he's been on Rogan quite a bit. Yes, that's why outside I'm his, familiar. Yeah. With him. Outside of his stand-up, I don't know like any any like TV stuff off the top of my head that he's done. But he had he had a local comic open up for him, and this kid got up there in front of a predominantly black audience and goes, uh, "I'm gonna tell some." He's like, "Sir, he's like, I'm gonna tell some Pokemon jokes." <laughs> uh, what? And nobody's laughing. And so he looks at the audience and says, "So I just need to let you all know I'm Jewish." And everybody's like looking confused, and we're like all looking at each other in the audience. And he like bolts off the stage, and everybody starts clapping. We thought like, yeah, finally he did a funny, funny. But no, he fucking bolted off the stage, like trying to tell a Pokemon joke. That like it's like, dude, do we, where did you get this Pokemon joke? Did you did you did you like really get like a popsicle that had like one of the the jokes on there? No, oh, yeah, you know, on the stick. Yeah, it, it, you know. it, it is hard to be funny. Like you, there are people who can be funny and like make a funny but it's different to be like a comic you know yes you know yeah. like i think uh like i always told this to one of my friends growing up he's like you're funny why don't you be a comic i'm like do you know how much work that is to sit down I... and write a whole bit and a skit and then to keep going yeah. on stage and practicing and failing it's like and be loose yes it is it is nerve-wracking yeah. like even just yeah, I... doing this could be nerve-wracking I did stand up a few times, believe it or not. Oh, I, wow. I did open mic nights at uh, at McGooby's Joke House in Baltimore. I uh, I did a few of them, and the thing is, like when you're starting out, like they'll give you like, hey, you're gonna come here for the open mic night, so you're you're waiting in the back room and just waiting and waiting and waiting, and also um, your drinks aren't comped, so you're like, you know, I just found myself like getting you know getting lit, so I'd be loose enough to go up there and, and like. <laughs> 
you know, by the time they, they like, if you're a new act, they're, they're not going to put you up first. They're exactly. going to put you, like, towards the end. And so, like, I'd get on at, like, 11.15, and I don't even remember half the jokes I told. I just remember going off about my grandmother and how she had the same haircut as John Madden. <laughs> she, she did. God rest her soul. But, <laughs> my Mom, you had the same haircut as John Madden, and I just did this thing about her going there with a copy of Madden 94 and, like, just <clears> make <throat> me look like that. Um <laughs> It was probably funnier at the time, but, but you know. Now, come it, on, it's Bobby. Hard. You got a clip right here with the number two across the middle yeah. over here. <laughs> you, know. you know, just like doing the whole bit of that. And again, Frank Caliendo kind of, you know, drove that one into to, to oblivion. Yeah. I was like, well, I can't tell these jokes anymore because now people are going to be like, you're ripping off Frank Caliendo. I'm like, no, I'm not ripping off Frank Caliendo because I'm actually funny. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Speaking you know, of John Madden, way. I want to I want to say this for a minute. The only thing I can remember about John Madden is when he did those uh, tenactic commercials. Do you remember those? Oh yeah, boom, tough active tenactic. That's and all I know people. about John Madden is football and tough active, uh, tough active tenactic. And I'm just like, you know, that's it because I that, I miss that time. <laughs> you don't remember like the Ace Hardware commercials he do and like? No, I don't remember God. those ones. Did you watch Mad TV at all? Uh, very rarely. You got I oh. I was like seven barely even double yeah. digits when that was going around dude mad, mad tv was great and will sasso used to do like these outtakes with john madden and he'd be like hey folks john madden here ace is your friendly hardware store he'd be like taking a table saw and cutting his finger off and like, oh. <laughs> i just remember those claymation uh crocodile hunter ones do you remember those oh ones? yeah yeah i remember those 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 were those were so br uh, brutal and violent and uh i think they did the uh godfather but it was rudolph do you remember that yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, they did do that. And he like, I remember like them being out in the middle of the lake with Herbie. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's like it's those. So are you like... want to be a dentist? <laughs> yeah, or the the abominable snowman just like grabbing the deer and eating his head off. It's, it's like comedy like that. It's like I a lot of these uh, a lot of people I know don't remember this stuff. So this is like great that I can yeah. actually just like finally sit down it, and... and like a lot of this stuff just hasn't been preserved. Like I don't know where you can go and even watch Mad TV anymore it's like so rare it's like uh sometimes like they'll pop up like on youtube if you'll randomly yeah, scroll clipped. you'll find like uh some people will have a dedicated channel like where they'll rerun like uh whole blocks of like old commercials or uh, yeah. whole blocks of like uh adult swim from this night or toonami from this day of this year and stuff like that it's just like the whole row because there are people that still have these uh things videotaped and saved yeah somewhere. And now they're just oh, finally uh, converting them to, you know, they're digital. You know, James sent me on a rabbit hole when he when he went on his Mega Man rant. When he was like, he was like so upset about that old Mega Man commercial. And I was like, I vaguely remember that. And I went and looked at <laughs> the kid. Going, <laughs> oh, I, uh, you broke up there. Your mic is messing up. Oh, yeah. It's probably the noise cancellation. The kid going like, I love Mega Man. <laughs> you know, um. And it's just kind of funny. Like, that's not actually how the kid is in the commercial, but it's just kind of funny, like, how time takes some of those memories and, and, and warps them. And uh, we remember them being a lot more bombastic than they actually were. Now, that commercial is shit. And <laughs> I, I don't think any kids back then, like, loved Mega Man at that point because, like, that was, like, at the tail end of Mega Man's popularity. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, I always remember the ones like when I couldn't sleep, like uh, the Esteban. You remember Esteban? Uh, he had the guitar infomercial, and no. he like stood on the guitar. No, I don't. I don't remember this one. It might also be a regional thing too. Sometimes regional. That's things. true too. The Ron Pupil uh, rotisserie oven was another one I remember. Yeah. Uh, and then I also really remember the pure moods and all those like, like, hey, here's a bunch of random songs that are vaguely similar. <laughs> on one CD for a low price. Oh, you yeah. Just, you know, yeah. tell me how can I... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, those ones. I remember those ones now. Yeah. Pure Moods is like the shittiest one, too, because it starts out and they're like, you know, they play all this Enya stuff. And I'm like, yeah, okay, like, I wouldn't listen to that, but I get what you're getting at. And then they're like, and who could forget the haunting melody of Tubular Bells? Yes. I'm like, wait a minute, who, who's like, I want to relax in the bathtub to the Exorcist theme. Exactly. And then... 
And then they, 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 they're like, but wait, there's more. And then they have DJ Dotto's remix of the X-Files theme. Take your, take your senses to another dimension. And I'm like, well, they don't go to other dimensions in the X-Files. But uh, <laughs> yeah, the last thing I want to do is take a bath and listen to a techno remix of the, of the X-Files. Theme. Oh, wait, there's another show theme. Remember Miami Vice? You can listen to Crockett's theme. <laughs> That's literally on Pure Moods. Pure Moods. Do you want to listen to the dubstep remakes of Quincy's opening theme song? <laughs> no, I, I don't. But the fact that hear the bass drop and the Sanford and Son theme like never before. Oh damn! <laughs> don't you want to relive your Columbo days? Yeah. <laughs> oh man, you know, speaking of co- commercials like that too, the old school like uh, porn commercials that they would always play, Girls Gone Wild and stuff like that. <laughs> the old like sex chatting sites, and the reason I'm bringing this up because when we were in Hawaii. Oh. Because Hawaii is so far behind on everyone else, they have, like, the super late-night commercials on at, like, yeah. 7 or 8 o'clock at night in Hawaii. Oh, God. So uh, we're watching uh, FX because we're just relaxing in for the night. And yeah. uh, all of a sudden, uh, at, like, 7 o'clock at night, you just pop on a screen. Are you lonely? I am a doctor. And I'm sitting here with my wife and my mom, and I'm watching this. I'm like, this is why I don't have cable anymore. <laughs> yeah, basically. Like every commercial that, like, no joke, this is the observation. Every commercial on FX was for uh, colon problems, elderly people getting their dicks hard, and can't uh, call girls. Okay, there's one. There's one like generic Viagra commercial that's great, where it's a guy basically yelling at the screen. Yeah. Um, and like the pills come individually packaged in like condom wrappers. Have you seen that one? No, I have not seen this one. That sounds oh, funny. God, I, I I forget what the name of it is. Um, I, I'm I'm looking it up now because it, it's time. like, yeah, it's it's it. it oh, God, it was it was hilarious because it caught us off guard because it's like this old indignant man like looking at the screen. And he like looks like he could be anybody's grandfather, but he's not married and he's like talking about hitting the town. <laughs> i'm gonna get me a sugar girl, baby yeah, and, 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 like how does having the pill in a condom wrapper make it any better <laughs> i'm gonna have to have this young lady open up this condom wrapper for me and, and then there's the the frank thomas testosterone commercials where he happens to live in the same commu- gated community as like all these guys that used to play in the cfl oh god and uh <laughs> And his, like, one 30-year-old neighbor is the guy that has low testosterone. And it's like, Frank, I don't think this pill's going to help him. Get him off the soy diet. Yeah. Frank, you were doing steroids. Leave him alone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just shoot him shoot him up with steroids, man. Yeah. Good. Speaking of another White Sox reference there, uh, because I'm from the Chicagoland area, uh, sometimes they, we got a local affiliate sports station called 670 to Score. And I used to listen to it. And they, used, they brought Ozzy Guillen on. And now Ozzy Guillen does dick pill commercials for 670 to score. <laughs> and it's it's funny listening to him with his accent talking about like, oh, yeah, sometimes you got to get a little power hitting in the bedroom. And I'm just like, oh, God, please make it stop. <laughs> just make it stop. I don't need to know Ozzy Guillen can't get his dick hard. Come on. <laughs> There's nothing worse when you step up the home plate with a limp bat. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, go take a quick second and shout out a couple people there. Mr. Cage, hello. Compa, hello. Thank you for joining. Compa says, I just remembered those annoying Here's Bob's commercials. <laughs> yeah. The art of making a good commercial can last with you forever. Like, people who make those commercial jingos, you know? I, I still, yeah. to this day, have uh, the Viva Viagra fucking theme stuck in my head for obvious reasons that it's just catchy. You know, they missed a golden opportunity. They should have had Ozzy Guillen step up the home plate holding a pole noodle. <laughs> this is no way to get, to get a home run on a Friday night. And he has to apologize for saying Fidel Castro is okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, that's his payment for it. I said uh, Fidel Elian Castro Gonzalez okay. is okay. Elian Gonzalez is the bat boy and gives him his pills. Here you go, Mr. Guillen. Thanks, kid. <laughs> Oh man, oh man. Sammy Sosa comes up, no one will ever know you corked your bat. <laughs> Sammy Sosa. Yeah. He doesn't recognize him. It's like, why are you white? <laughs> Have yeah. you seen Sammy Sosa recently? Yes. I'm like, what the hell's going on here? What happened to him? Did he, did he also have a mental breakdown? <laughs> Just like. <laughs> oh, I that drug was called Enzite. Enzite. Oh, God, I remember that name. 
Didn't it like make you like? Didn't they get sued? They probably did. They all get sued in the they end. Probably it feels like. did. Somebody's dick probably blew up. Uh, hello, Chris. Welcome and join in. Says Chris. Says uh, loving this conversation so far. Y'all are so quick on the draw with the comedy. <laughs> I like. How, I like how that's the comment right after he said somebody's dick probably blew up from taking it. You know. <laughs> Experimental boner pills. Well, because they they always say something fucking crazy, right? It's like, oh, side effects may include your asshole will bleed for three weeks, and uh, you might get cancer of the eyes. But your depression will be gone, and your dick yeah. will not get hard either. And always, oh, Chris says he's sub two figure action for you there over there. Oh, awesome! Well, Chris, check out the uh, the giveaway there if you're a subscriber and you're in the U.S. Because that is that is going to be a, an awesome one to give away. Yeah, Chris is a real, uh, good guy. I know him from the Mr. Matty Plays Discord. Very funny guy. Happy that he's become more active in there. Happy that he came out now. He's currently at uh, PAX East in Boston. Nice. So uh, thank you for stopping by. I hope you're having a good time out there with uh, the other boys that decided to go out there. You know, I, I guess I'm going out there next year because they're finally pulling me into that as well. <laughs> I got to just take my wife, though. She's like... Oh, I want to go too. And I'm like, all right, you can stay in the hotel room. She's like, no, I want to go to PAX. I'm like, you don't like video games. What, what are you going to do there? And she's like, I do like video games. Just drop her off in the walking simulator, simulator situation, uh, whatever they have there for those for that I, I just, genre. I just told her, I'm like, you're in Boston. Just go outside and call it like a black people slur. That's what you do there, right? <laughs> pretend, <laughs> pretend you're Mark Wahlberg circa 1993. Exactly. Or play Edward Forty Hands with some random Irish youth. <laughs> You know, can, can we also agree on this one, too, that uh, women with like a Boston accent are the ugliest thing in the world? I I would say that, but but the Canadian accent for some of them, like the, you know. Like, Ryan, that was a thing Ryan Long did where, you know, he's talking about like how gross Canadian women can be at times. <laughs> Not all of them, but some of them like, oh, yeah, just pop it in here, bud. You know, come here. <laughs> yeah, that that sort of accent i'm like yeah that's that's like the boston accent not you know turned up a little bit oh you you mean the midwest accent got it yeah <laughs> that's that's the problem when you're around here oh now don't you know there bobby hey oh god bobby's world yeah i was yeah. like uh yeah howie mandel would, would only howie mandel would think you know hey i'm gonna create the most unfuckable fictional wife <laughs> outside of the the parents from life with louis but god damn louis anderson your parents oh, were a train wreck Oh, you know, fucking, the worst part was, uh, you know, here, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you on this one. <laughs> so uh, my governor of my state, uh, Mr. J.B. Pritzker, has a cousin who is uh, transgender and they posted a picture of uh, his cousin. And the only thing I could think of was like, holy shit, this this person looks like Louis Anderson from Baskets. I, I couldn't get it out of my head. I was just <laughs> like, that's all I saw. And I felt so bad for it kind of saying this. But I'm at the same time, I'm like, well, fuck it. They're from a billionaire family, so who cares? We can mock them to shit. And I just can't get it out of my head. Every time I, like, just see, like, J.B. Pritzker, now I just see it's, like, Louis Anderson from Baskets. That's all I see. God rest Louis Anderson's soul. Uh, oh, yeah. Legend lost way too too soon. But, yeah, his mother in that show definitely looked like a flesh-colored version of the Grimace from McDonald's. <laughs> Uh, Chris checking in as a Bostonian with a Canadian fiance. Thank you for your contributions to my further arguments, Extra Zero. Look, just have sex on mute. <laughs> That's all you gotta do. Yeah, you just put on the rain machine in the background. You just, just, or just, it up. just, just put on like voice changing helmets, so you kind of vaguely sound like uh, Darth Vader, but with bad accents. Oh like... God, that would be that's that's a fetish. You already just you know that's a fetish already. It's like those people... Pop it, pop it in there, bud. <laughs> Don't you know. I'll show you the dark side. <laughs> Bend over. Give me the dark side, Luke. Oh, God, no. There's a fetish already happening. I know this exists somewhere. You know it does. Yeah, and unfortunately, it'll manifest on May the 4th. It probably will. It's like... Yeah. So, like, you know, speaking of, like, weird fetishes, like, did you ever see the one... We're going deep, guys. We're, did you ever see the one where it's, like, people who dress up in, like, dragon suits and they hump, like, yes. super fancy cars? Yeah. Like, who... How does that happen? What abuse happened in your life where you're just like, man, today uh, I just really want to fuck a, a Ferrari as a dragon. I don't know why. Look, there was a double feature of Cars and Shrek, and they just they got their wires crossed. Yeah, it's like, I, I just wanted to be the dragon from Shrek, and... You know, that was the first time I got a boner, and in front of me it was just an Impala, and I just lost it. <laughs> you know, it's just... Have, have you seen that guy on My Strange Addiction? 
Uh, which one is there's the, so the many guy that the guy <laughs> narrows it down by cars. like none <laughs> my strange addiction so th- there's a guy that's like obsessed with cars right you said yeah well he had he was in a sexual relationship with a car and they did a follow-up episode on him over 10 years later and he now has four cars he has a harem of cars oh god this should be an anime and this sounds like an anime. it should be an anime <laughs> and well actually he has he has um he has two cars an SUV, and now he's also fucking a jet ski. Oh, God. Diversifying. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's gone nautical. I'm sure I'm sure he'll have a boat when all's said and done. Yeah. Chris says over here, I only bang to the national anthem, so I don't have to hear a thing she's talking about. Oh, wow. Well. Very patriotic. Conquer that's, that's, her. That gives a whole new meaning to O Canada. <laughs> so... All right, so let's get on to like our main topic here because this is a video game show. You wouldn't know it if you yes. listened to the first hour of this, but this is uh, mostly a video game show. And video games, like you said, going back to like the seventies, you know, yeah, there has been a massive array of just like funny, weird, and funny because they're terrible video games. And uh, you know, let just just let's talk about some of our favorite ones that are definitely out there. Uh, since you are the guest, Mr. Zero, you should start off with the, the good one. I mean, like, I don't know if I want to start new or old, I guess maybe the funniest game I've ever played, like legitimately funny. Um, God, I, I remember the, the first time I really like belly laughed at a game was, was probably conquers bad fur day. And I'm sure that was oh, probably like, that's a good for one. a lot of people. That was, that was like the, the game that was, that was, that was funny. Like between the sunflower with the giant tits, and, <laughs> you know, the great mighty. And back then it was just like oh. cursing for the sake of cursing was, was funny. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I really liked games that were unintentionally funny. Like, um, you know, I know, I know it's been done to death because of AVGN, but the um, the Bible Adventures game. Oh yeah. Uh, I miss the old days of EGM because Sean Baby. I don't know if you remember him. He was the one that put Bible Adventures on on my radar because just of how how absurd the game was. Like you know, the whole Baby Moses game where you could just chuck the bastard in the river and complete <laughs> the level, and the only thing you got was this little slap on the wrist that said "Great job," but you forgot Baby Moses, even if you threw him to the cobras or threw him in the fucking river. And then uh, then there was the Noah's Ark game where Noah was like stacking animals like it was fucking burger time. Oh yeah, I remember that one. You know. When you say the Noah's Ark game to go with the more absurd one, but like Super Noah's Ark where it's yeah. like a doom clone and it's like i remember reading about that and thinking it was fake <clears throat> no it's it's very real yeah. <laughs> i have it for steam and i give it away a few times it's yeah I, I i have it on steam it was on like one of the fanatical bundles and i was like okay I, the, the time has come for me to own this legitimately uh and, and then there's games that like i thought were cool at the time and then looking back it was like what the fuck were they think like shack fu <laughs> It's such a terrible game, you too. know. And they even remade it in modern times. They it's actually they, did it. They, even remade, they made it a beat 'em up because Shaq Fu was this like fighting game that like EA was like, look, we we can't do anything with this, guys. This is just this is a shit fighting game. What are we gonna do? And then you know, I just picture Shaquille O'Neal like, put me in, coach. <laughs> I'll put my name on this. And that, that's the wasn't that also like uh, I don't know, it was an SNL skit or was it a. Uh, Mad TV one where it's like they put Shaquille O'Neal in Lord of the Rings, yeah, and they I called it was... like Lord of the Bling, and, he, and he's like shooting laser eyes out of his cross eyes. I just remember that. <laughs> I just, I just remember that very fondly. It was just like this, just Shaquille O'Neal going like, "You gotta give me the bling," and then he's just shooting lasers out of his eyes. I'm like, "What the hell is going on here?" Oh, Diablo checking in. Diablo, I recently played a childhood game, uh, Gen uh, uh, Kiddo, Gen Kiddo. And it's honestly bad. Amazing soundtrack, but bad game. I have no idea what that game is. What system was that for, Mr. Diablo? Sorry. But please, Mr. Zero, continue on. I, I think really games games started becoming legitimately funny around the um the you know the PS1 era. I think I think I had a lot of laughs with wrestling games back in the day, like mm. uh SmackDown and uh, a buddy of mine had the the um, he had all the the N sixty four games. Was it was where there was all the Ukes, I think. But you know, we we just really got into like creating wrestlers, people we knew, and of course, like again, EGM was was fostering this because EGM was like 
here's the recipe to create the character we made, Elephant Sack. And it was just like basically it was supposed to be like this guy with, you know, Elephant Titus of the balls. <laughs> uh, you know, we, 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 we do like, you know, now people do like streams where they have like lolcal wrestling. Um, you know, but, but we were we were doing that amongst amongst friends. When you get to the PS2, I think that's when like, you know, again, Conquer kicked it off that PS1 era. There was some stuff on um, the PlayStation 1 era, like be it bad translations. I mean, I, I, I will never forget the time I, you know, I got my PlayStation 1 and I was a, a Mega Man fan. We were talking about, you know, riffing on, on James for that Mega Man commercial. But yeah. I'll never forget going to Hollywood Video, renting Mega Man 8, and then hearing uh, the Dr. Wily voice for mm-hmm. the first time. You know, oh, Mega Man. It, it sounded like Elmer Fudd. We have to stop Dr. We have to stop Dr. Light, you know. And that was the real voice in the game. And I just remember, like, you know, I wanted to take a Mega Man game semi-serious. But you have Mega Man sounding like a little boy <laughs> or a little girl, really. And this, like, you know, Dr. Light sounding like Elmer Fudd if he sat on his balls. <laughs> Speaking of the PS1, uh, did you ever hear of a game called Rising Xan? Rising Zan, it sounds familiar. You wouldn't know because it had like one of the most catchy like '90s like theme song. It was called. It was like Rising. Oh, I Zan. remember that. I remember seeing the 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 uh, the Samurai Gunman. Yeah, Samurai I seeing Gunman. That. <laughs> yeah, and that game is incredibly bad, but is incredibly like funny in terms of like unintentionally funny because of the translation and just the concept material of the game. Like, it was one of those games that localization just kind of, like, messed up, but in a good way for us. I, I remember, too, you know, there were a lot of games that, that, in that era, I guess, a lot of it had to do with the fact that games on the PlayStation 1 were so cheap to make. We were getting games that normally would have stayed in Japan, like Incredible Crisis. Mm-hmm. and uh, Oh, I love Incredible Crisis. Yeah. Well, I... I I thought that was like a better version of uh, of Mario Party in in certain ways. I mean, it, granted, it didn't have the multiplayer uh, element that uh, that Mario Party had, but I, for the most part, I was playing Mario Party alone because my friends hated that game. <laughs> so I guess as a mini game collection, it was it was fun. Um, but you know that that just had some zany, off the wall Japanese stuff that you had to see to believe. Uh, you also got Pepsi Man. Oh, I was just there. about to say Pepsi Man. You're like yeah. reading my mind right now, man. And that was another game that I remember, you know, getting off of Limewire. I had that back in that era. I was able to mod my PS1 in high school, and um, you know, so I remember downloading Pepsi Man and like saying to my friend, "You wouldn't believe it. This is a game that exists." And the the cutscenes were what made that worthwhile. And again, you know, shout out to AVGN for for highlighting all of that. Um, yeah. It's, especially but the, the, like uh, the more I've been doing retro collecting too, uh, it's just like there's so many weird and interesting games that even came out in like Europe too, like were just European only games that I never even heard about until like just recently. I like uh, I think you you might have seen the memes of this one, like Attack of like the Ten Thousand Woman or something like that. Do you re- remember that one? Um, I, I remember there was one called uh, Demolition Girl on PlayStation Two. Yeah, I think it might be the and, same one. Is that yeah. the one where you're flying in a helicopter and you got to yeah, make the woman's boobs bigger? Yeah, it's like this girl is like <laughs> at the beach and this octopus thing comes down and yeah, you're you're shooting her. You know, like you have to like shoot her in the boobs and shoot her in the butt and um, yeah, that was uh, that was one that that uh, we played. Uh, the last time I was I, I went on like a, a a retreat with friends. We 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 played we played the hell out of that one. I. I uh, sat there watching my friend play that I was like wow this is this is interesting yeah that's, that's uh, true, but sure. still laughing laughing my ass off uh the playstation 2 oh actually oh there was another one too um it was uh you can't no one can stop mr domino oh a, my goodness jesus yeah. you're like talking about games that i don't think anyone but like you and me understand right now yeah <laughs> like i i i'm blown away that you know about like no one can stop mr domino that game is so weird and fun. I actually wanted to stream that as soon as I get a better uh, uh, capture card for sure. But it's just, damn, you're like blowing me away. I love this. Keep going, man. And the, like the, you know, we we're talking a little bit. The PlayStation Two era is where games got really ridiculous. And again, like I think you know, in that era, they were kind of riding high off of doing some more experimental games. They were yep. trying to get catalogs mm-hmm. of games and you know they're just trying to find their footing and you saw a lot of re- and and there were there were things that, that came out on the playstation 2 that were 
even more innovative than what's being released today. Oh, easy. Uh, there's a game called um, Robot Alchemetic Drive, or RAD. Yep. And, you know, we were talking about it before the show, and you play as this guy, and, and you know, this kid, he, he gets a giant mech he can control. And the concept's amazing. Like, you have to get the vantage points where you can see the mech to make it fight. But the dialogue in the game is terrible. <laughs> and there's a line in the game where this, this girl's talking, it's supposed to be serious, and she goes, a robot killed grandma! And it's just like, how can you take... And they, they, they used to play that all the time on X-Play. They would cut to it back when X play was good. Oh man, I think it was still extended play at that point. Yeah, and I was just like, I need to play this game just for this robot killed grandma line. And you know, back then, you know, gaming wasn't it hadn't overtaken movies. It was still niche. Uh, in the Dreamcast era, you got a lot of bad translations. I loved, I loved how terrible the translation, the the dub in uh, House of the Dead Two is. <laughs> you know, with every time they're, they're like talking to G. <laughs> um you know please help me you know, you know it's just such a, it, it's unintentionally funny stuff uh it's... blue stinger was another one with a bad translation as well Oh god yeah those those are some the, the bad translation or and just like the flat voice actor deliveries like the old resident evil you jill the master of unlocking <laughs> i was almost a jill sandwich yeah uh, what, what, what's up mm. What's the um, other there's, one I'm of? there's a game on PlayStation 2. Um, I'm trying to think what I, it is. Was it Troublemakers? It was a, it was an Atlas or a Treasure game, where in order to do, you you played as this girl who had a a hat that had arms on it, and you the, to beat most of the enemies, you would pinch their nipples. I was just playing the, that game, Stretch yeah. Panic. Stretch Panic. Stretch that was Panic. It. Yeah, and the and they got like those giant titties, and they couldn't helicopter yeah. in the air. Yeah, like it's just. It's, yeah, you, uh, when you, you I, a lot of people got introduced to Japanese culture in the PS2 area, and a lot of people still have not recovered from it. <laughs> yeah, and all those all those original Ratchet and Clank games were legit funny on mm -hmm. on PlayStation 2. I mean they they were they were they were riding that line that I think DreamWorks kind of perfected early on, where you make jokes that go over kids' heads, but if you if you actually are paying attention, they're 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 really funny. I mean, all the early Ratchet and Clank games had really raunchy titles. Yep. Uh, going you know, Commando, your arsenal, your arsenal. Yeah, go, yeah, yeah, and uh, go on, yeah, they, Oh no, it's like it, it's like it, it sucks that they they've lost that edge, and now it's just like ah, oh, rift apart. And, uh, you know, now it's South Park's kind of picked up the uh, the mantle there with fractured butthole. Yeah, and you know, st stick a truth though that that game, oh, that is like a breath of fresh air of old school yeah. raunchy comedy. The abortion uh, scene is still probably oh, one of the funniest parts in that game. I laughed so hard for that one. I I think I think though I, I think Stick a Truth's the better game with the better combat system. Yes, but I, agree. I, I like. The moment I wish I wish I could have recorded myself in Fractured Butthole. The moment you get to the Jared Fogel boss battle, <laughs> like they, you know, they they accepted what happened to Jared. They they referenced the old episode when he comes out. He's like, he's still looking good, eating <laughs> all the sandwiches. <laughs> Waltz is out of his prison cell. Hi, kids. You want to eat fresh? God, they're they're. Like those South Park games, they still continue the good one. Like this, the, the boss battle for you got to fight the Mongolians on top of the shitty walk. Yes. The you got to you got to fight Man Bear Pig, and it's just Al Gore. I, I also too like the fact that um, you know they had like the Mister Slave finishing or the summon like the, oh, you know, where he, he did like God, the, the yes. yeah the Paris Hilton finisher where he did pull, you know, slowly pushes the chair out, and hops on it, and. <laughs> He sucks them in. Uh, oh my god, uh, that that game is just wild. And like I keep saying, like when I go back to the abortion team, and like it's just Christmas time comes once yes. a year. It's just like sometimes like comedy isn't always just like the joke is like really good. It's just like you have just something so outrageous playing in the background you can't forget about it. And it's just like I. And the funny part was I was playing it at around Christmas time. So it's just like it sticks in my head even more. It was like this is so weird. <laughs> You'll be sitting there like thinking about Christmas, then you hear it's Christmas time, and I'm just thinking about a fake abortion or messing it up and then sucking up Randy's balls. <laughs> and you know, it's just funny too. There, there were so many games that just, you know, I think open open world games have kind of lost their soul because, you know, open world games used to have, and it wasn't just GTA. 
Mm-hmm. Um, the open world Hulk game, I think it was Hulk Incredible Destruction. Yes. I had a sense Hulk of game. humor. Yeah, absolutely. It was, you know, it kind of it kind of took the foundation of Spider-Man 2. Everybody like likes to think about Spider-Man 2 and, you know, how it really um, revolutionized the open world superhero game. And, and mm-hmm. really, game design hasn't changed much since that. And that was, what, 2004, 2003? Yeah, roughly around that time, early 2000s. Yeah. And um, maybe it was 2002. I, I, I'm, I'm really struggling to remember because it was it – was, um, I'm going to Google that real quick. Well, because on top of that, too, just to, while you're doing this, it's like they also had all these great – support. Yeah, they had all these great good uh, – great good. That's, st- that's stupid to say. These great uh, hero games, too, not just Spider-Man 2, yeah. but Ultimate Spider-Man 2 – you can't yeah, I love that, that one. one where you get to play Venom and you get to kill a little kid too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and they they actually play off of the the balloon kid in the uh in the Spider-Man 2 game that everybody was was like riffing on. Uh Simpsons Hit and Run was a, a great, great I mean, you know, the Simpsons had kind of like lost its edge, but Hit and Run was just hilarious and you could run over, you know, characters and kids and and do stuff that you couldn't do in GTA because it was a cartoon universe. It didn't take itself too seriously. It felt like a, a it felt like an episode of the Simpsons that we never got and it was it was legit funny. Uh Hulk, but going back to Hulk, like the thing I loved about it, I remember um a buddy of mine was uh he was going to film school in Florida at the time and I stayed with him for a week and he had a modded Xbox and he just had all, you know, every game under the sun. Yeah, uh, he had a giant hard drive in there, so I was like, "Oh, you know, here's a game I never played, Hulk Ultimate Destruction." And I remember like picking people up and just tossing them in the air, and they're still alive, and just hitting them with the telephone pole, and you hear like the crack of a baseball bat, and they're screaming and flying to the distance. And I was like, "Holy shit, this is funny!" You could rip a bus in half and turn it into like, you know, boxing gloves for the Hulk. Oh and, yeah, and, and you know, this I, I I think I think. You know, what game designers then understood was the line between creativity and humor and how you can take creativity and humor and make something really engaging for a player. Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of lost. Now it's just like, hey, we've created the sandbox for you, but you have to play by our rules. I think, like, Just Cause was one of the last games to really get that. Yep. Um, I, I've been playing Teardown recently, and that that's a game that I, I've had a lot of fun with. It's not really funny, per se, but I, I've had you know, fun with like, you know, how, how much can I break this game? How much can I do? And I'm just thinking like, if they had this game with like people running around, it would be awesome. Uh, Paint the Town Red is a, a game I really enjoy, even though it has very little substance. And it's a game where you just get into fist fights, and it's a voxel based fist fight game. It has a survival mode in it. So it's not just that. But I, I love that you could just play a bar fight and just and just see, try and survive be the last man standing and have fun with it. And you, you can get to the point where people are, like, literally stripped down. They've gotten so beaten that they're just, like, walking zombie-looking things. Because uh, they design, like, you know, not it's voxel-based, so, like, every little bit of them can come off. And, uh, you know, occasionally they'll survive, and they'll just, like, look like the Terminator, where, like, half their face is gone, and they're still trying to fist fight you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and sound design was a big part of that game. So, like, you can pick anything up in that environment. Like, you can pick a guitar up and just smack somebody. And it makes the uh, the old uh, El Mariachi noise from, uh, God, what was that old Hanna-Barbera cartoon with the horse? Oh. Oh, damn. I um, I know what you're talking about, but I'm blanking. Was it Quick Draw McGraw? Maybe it was Quick Draw. Was he a white horse? Yeah, he was a white. Tr- yeah, it was, it was Quick, Quick Draw. Draw. Yeah. Yeah, because he used to beat the shit out of people with the guitar, and I just remember hearing the boom, you know, noise from the guitar. Yeah, and, nah, yeah. Oh, Jesus yeah. Christ, that's that's oof, that's a throwback. That's when my grandma was alive. You're making me think of my <laughs> grandma now. <laughs> yeah, that got that, and that's that's making me feel old. Uh, yeah, yeah, because I, I think the last time I ever saw a Quick Draw was on Harvey Birdman. Oh my yeah, goodness! He, Did you ever see yeah. the Harvey Birdman video game? Uh, yeah, I own that on Wii. It only came out on Wii. No, it came out on PSP as well. I have it for the it did. PSP. Oh, okay. Shit. Yeah, that was a really good fe- – that was like a good use of the Phoenix Wright formula. Oh, I love Phoenix Wright. D- didn't Capcom also make the Harvey Birdman game? Yes, they did. Yes, yeah. they did. And speaking of Capcom, while we're talking about it, because we're talking about the PS2 generation and all that stuff, Capcom was like one of those devs that understood how to make a – japanese game where it's like there was like yeah. that weird sense of humor and like also just like it was actually fun so like we're gonna talk about beautiful joe we're gonna talk about god hand we're gonna talk about Under the Skin. another one yeah what'd you say sorry 
Maximo, the uh, the, Maximo, the long yeah. forgotten. You know, and it's funny because back then journalists were complaining that that was too hard, <laughs> and it was a punishing game. But I was like, I, I played Ninja Gaiden. That was way harder than this. And and just to bring it up too, Resident Evil Four, like mm-hmm. the original Resident Evil Four was a funny game. You know, it's like yeah, well, uh, Louise was the comic relief in that. Yeah. Yeah. There's the president's daughter, and she has ballistics. You know, yes. I, I had to explain uh, that line to Fernando just because, because uh, we were talking about a fire emblem character, and I'm like, yeah, she's she comes equipped with ballistics, and he's like, what does that mean? I'm like, get the fuck out of my house. <laughs> get the fuck out right now. <laughs> yes, how dare you sully my my house like this? <laughs> like even even like Katamari was was a, a oh, pretty funny game. Katamari um, Damacy was like. I think that was like the first true real experience. I think for a lot of people to Japanese, see like, like truly Japanese, full Japanese. Like I, it was 20 bucks too. That was like yeah. the goat of the PS2 when you're a kid. And I, like you were talking about X play and they had uh, X play did the review of it. And then you're, I'm just like a kid and I'm like, this looks awesome. And then you're just going around and you're just start off picking up like little small stuff and then all of a sudden you're just wiping the earth clean and picking up god himself and everything yeah it's, it's and, like, and wild. yeah that was the thing is that they they would do stuff in the game that would like seem like the game was breaking like you're like i shouldn't be able to do that and i think i think that's like one of the things that's missing in terms of innovation in games now it's just like hey let's build this big giant world okay and then what well, no, we, we we used all our money making this big giant world. Yes, and then it's going to be full of bugs because we, it's a yeah. big giant world and all the scripts are running at once and then we're going to put yep. it out to millions of people. So now we're going to have the chance of errors go up by uh, billions. <laughs> yeah, and everything's going to be so super serious. Like, um, you know, speaking of, of Japanese games, I, I mean, it did, it did get a cartoon out in the U.S., but uh, Ultimate Muscle was oh. a fun wrestling game. Yes, uh, they, I just no picked that up for the yeah. GameCube recently, actually. Yeah, and Dick Dick Van Dick. Dick Dick Van Dick. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it just seemed like, you know, there was a time, that was the time in gaming where they, they, it just, there was stuff that was serious and there's stuff that wasn't. And it was just like, where else but video games can you get stuff that, that is serious or completely ri- ridiculous or walks a line? Mm hmm. And it's just unfortunate now, like, everything in gaming is just trying to be, for the most part, everything, uh, at least on, on consoles, is trying to be super serious. Because I do do want to talk about, like, how PC, like, you, you definitely have a lot of stuff with a sense of humor on PC. Though, I think there are some developers that do understand levity, like, uh, you know, and, and even if dark humor, like, uh, Devolver is a studio. That, I that love totally Devolver Digital. Yeah. They are the publisher of one of my favorite games from a couple years ago now, uh, Cult of the Lamb absolutely love that game that's a game that knows exactly what it wants to do you know yeah and uh did you have you played it or seen some of their i I have not it's it's on my wish list i need to i have a backlog but just i i i need to i need to get around to playing it because i i love so many other games hotline miami was my first uh my first uh toe in the water if you will i got that um i got that on uh ps on my ps vita and i I just became addicted to that yeah uh, the music was amazing. Um, the the gameplay the gameplay hook you know just you, just going into a, a house and, and clearing it out it was just like a, a perfect pick up and play game for mm-hmm. for portable. Uh, it, it it the controls are way better on on PC but I mean you know the PSP was the Vita at least was interesting because you know the dual stick design yep. actually made it playable as a portable game and I just I couldn't put it down. Uh, that was like that for a long time. That was every day of my lunch break. I was just going through that game, and then oh, it's got a set. It's got an you know a, a true ending and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, they they definitely get like the whole dark humor aspect. Uh, my friend Pedro, oh, that's not a great my one. favorite, but I still love the game, and it ha- definitely has a great sense of humor. Um, have you played Carrion? I've played a little bit of it when I was on Game Pass. Uh, I think I got distracted, though, so I didn't play that much. Yeah, worth, worth a play. Through. It, unfortunately, that's a game that you kind of have to play in a week or, or, or a few things. Because the, the map isn't the most varied thing. It's a, it's a, definitely a unique Metroidvania-style game because you're play, it's on its head. You're playing as the alien right. trying to pick off all the humans. And... Um, you know, but the, you you can create some funny scenarios as you're trying to bait people and they're getting scared and um, yeah, definitely had a lot of fun with that. Uh, and, and PC, you know, 
we'll, we'll get into into the PC stuff, but but Devolver definitely is is a studio that that, that people really need to check out oh, yeah. because those games, it's a forgotten art of walking that line of silly and serious, yeah. and, and they get it. And uh, Diablo asked, did the devs put uh, sex in Cult of the Lamb? They actually did, but not like this graphic, uh, raunchy one. It's like they put in the ones where you can make your cult followers have a kid, and then that kid gets indoctrinated into your cult. So, yes, they did put it in there. And uh, that, that that Twitter account that runs it is actually pretty funny, too. I'm not going to lie. They're, they're unhinged. <laughs> and I love it the best way to be shadow warrior too is like one of the last funny first person shooters oh my um, god unintentionally funny i think yeah I, it's I, I think there's intention like I, they won me over because i'm a big transformers guy yeah. when they when they, they they had him you know blasting stan bush's the touch in the opening <laughs> cutscene. i'm like okay you got me I, I i love this game now now i got a question for you since we're like gonna go a little bit off topic here you're a big transformers guy Mm -hmm. please for the love of god tell me you're the only other person that has played the atari transformer game for the ps2 oh i owned it oh Oh, thank god i i I loved that game uh and then another unintentional funny thing is they they put ragdoll physics on everything in that yes and i i loved that because it was you know at at the time you know physics engines and games were a big deal and everybody forgot that that was like the ray tracing of the early 2000s (laughs) oh yes especially in halo and all that stuff like it had ragdoll physics. You were having a wonderful multiplayer experience. Yeah. It, it it certainly reinvigorated the, the love of a grenade in a first person shooter because mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, you know, I, I want to toss this grenade just to see how many guys I can make you know, just fly off into the distance, how many grunts I can make fly off in the distance and ragdoll over a hill and just watch them roll down the hill. Um, but yeah, that, that Atari Transformers game was legit. Yes. And um, it's funny, too, because there's there's a lot of debate. that So Hasbro's releasing a title. You remember the character Tidal Wave? He was probably the best, the most iconic boss yeah. battle in that game. Yeah, he was the giant aircraft carrier, correct? Yeah. In, in the cartoon, he was not that big. But in 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 the uh, in the game, they they made him size appropriate, which mm-hmm. was awesome because I you know I still and whenever I think of that game, I, I always think of uh, aside from from the first level where you're driving around in the uh, in the Mayan ruins, mm-hmm. just when you get to that level and and he rises mm-hmm. up out of the ocean and then uh, yeah, they're they're making the 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 toy way bigger than it should be just because of how iconic he was in that game. So they're releasing him as a Titan class, which I think is just amazing. Oh, when uh, like, I I loved Transformers as a kid. I always wanted the original Unicron that they released, but I could never afford that when I was a kid. Well, the the thing was oh, oh the uh, Armada Unicron. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, I was gonna say the original Unicron got canceled, but yeah, the Armada one. Yeah, I I had that as a as in a young adult. <laughs> I uh, I ended up uh, selling that one. Uh, and then I got the Amazon one that they re-released in 2011, and now I have the HasLab, and I also have the uh, the Studio Cell one, which is nuts. That, that's insane. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, that that's still very cool to have like a hobby like that. You know, like it is, it is still technically like a piece of art. It's like a statue. I collect statues. I collect little yeah. figures and all that stuff too. It's just the difference between is like my toy can't do anything it's just a statue i just there sit there and look at it you know yeah. I, I like the the masterpiece ones i i still collect the the generations ones though i i kind of have to get out of those because i'm running out of space and yeah. you know my, my wife's constantly reminding me like you're out of space and i'm like yes i know oh yeah and shoving them yeah, yeah i don't want it to look cluttered i i like it i like it being like this uh personal music and i said i think i said this on side scrollers when craig asked me like well, well you know why do you collect and i said well you know it's something that was like very near and dear to me and it wasn't just part of my childhood it's been part of my entire life it's mm-hmm. been something i've been very passionate about uh because yeah the, the 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 bay movies i'm not a fan of those and the new cartoon can kick rocks and, and in fact uh, the last good cartoon was from over 10 years ago. Those Transformers Prime was an yeah. excellent show. Um, you know, and, and you still get you still get good stuff here and there. I like the Bumblebee movie. That was made by Travis Knight, same guy that did Kubo and the Two Strings. Oh, okay. Um, you know, Rise of the Beasts wasn't very good. It wasn't as bad as any of the Bay movies, but it wasn't very good. But, you know, there's still things that I, I like. The, the Skybound comics are actually awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, we're... we're you know the games have all been phenomenal. Um, 
not all the games. Let's let's go back because the yes. Atari one is is phenomenal. The uh, War and Fall of Cybertron games are amazing. The Platinum Transformers Devastation was was also amazing. And there's some shovelware stuff in there, like, uh, the, and the movie games are always hit or miss. The second one, the Revenge of the Fallen game, was was pretty decent, but the first Transformers game was average. Dark of the Moon game was average. Rise of the Dark Spark was terrible. Um, but there, there's there's good stuff, and you yeah, still like, get good games. Yeah, I want to play the War on Cybertron series by Highland Studios. I hear that is really good. Yeah, it's just I I finally got them uh, recently because everyone kept saying, "Oh, you gotta play it. These are really good games." And I'm like, "Yeah, I need to sit down and play those one day." And uh, yeah, kind of kind of like the one thing just to get a little off topic here, but like that's like one thing I'm hoping that we see from this uh, Activision Blizzard uh, stuff with Microsoft. Is that they said they found the code for those games, yeah. so they still have it. What's What's crazy too is you'd think that they were nearing a re-release because literally the end of last year, Hasbro started this whole Gamerverse line for Transformers yeah. and started releasing uh, updates of the characters from the first game oh, wow, that never really? got toys. Like Barricade never got a toy from the first game. Um, they did a, uh, a a new version of the Optimus Prime, Cliff Jumper, Bumblebee. Um, they just showed off Sideswipe, so they're they're doing updated toys. It's like, well, you're doing these updated toys. Where are the you know where are the games yeah. so people can actually play and 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 see like you know I it, I I think Hasbro is ready to license them. I don't think that's going to be a problem because yeah. they're going to be like hey, you know you're going to make these an HD update. You're going to probably get charged thirty forty bucks for them. Um, you know, we're, we're just going to collect residuals on these and, and it, they'll sell our toys a little bit better. Yeah. Uh, Angry Canadian comes in and says, I love Transformers Prime too. Yeah, it's a fine. fantastic show and great voice acting too. Ernie Hudson's in it. You got Peter Cullen reprising his role as Optimus Prime. Oh, wow. Um, you got, uh, Josh Keaton as Jack. Uh, they got, um, um, shit. Jeffrey Combs, the reanimator was, was ratchet. And um, they even got um, uh, Michael Ironside to do the voice of uh, of Ultra Magnus, which was was amazing. Oh, nice! Oh, Michael Ironside, man, that. Oh, and Tony Todd was in it too. He was Dreadwing. Ooh, wow! They had, so... had a little budget behind it if they got all that in there. Yeah, I don't know how they pulled it off. I mean, at the time, Hasbro launched their own um, network, the Hub, which lasted for a year and a half. Yeah. Anger Canadian but. comes in. And Wheeljack was my favorite character in that show. Yeah, Wheeljack was awesome in that. They they made him one of the the. He stopped being a scientist in that one, but he was he was a complete badass. Uh, they made him one of the wreckers. So going on to some more uh, video game focused topics here. What are some unintentionally funny games like that you could think of? Oh man, um, well we already talked about Bible Adventures uh, and House of the Dead. Um, I mean, Ultimate Muscle, I think, was one of them. There's a lot of Japanese games. Um, man, I, I think that there, there were a lot of games that were mistranslated, um, you know, back in the NES days. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then there, there were a lot of games that were glitchy, too. Um, I think that... Like Bethesda games can be unintentionally funny. I can uh, hundred percent attest to that. That they add yeah. some charm to the game. For... Yeah, you know, you know, be it like I remember the first time playing Oblivion, um, or not Oblivion, Skyrim, and you know, just riding my my horse past a troll, and being like, "Yeah, I gotta, I got, I, I don't think I'm strong enough to fight this guy because you know, you just, you know, I just like escaped." you know the the opening area yeah and the troll like slammed its club down and i just flew off into space yeah the giants yeah that those were the those yeah glitches. or like you're just riding along the plane and you're just like oh it's just just a weird day and all of a sudden you see a mammoth spawn and it just falls <laughs> and dies and you're like huh okay uh it's just like what, what yeah. are you gonna do or you're walking around in fallout 4 and then all those like uh mutated bears there's like seven of them floating in the air and i'm like uh, i don't know why that's happening you know or did you ever uh, get the random one in skyrim where you just get a random dragon soul and you don't know why no i never had that happen that was, it was like one of the weirdest things i'm just like walking around and all of a sudden like my character just gets enveloped in like 
all this like golden light. I'm like, what the fuck's happening? And it's like, you killed the dragon. You got a dragon soul and then epic music playing. I'm like, what, what, what's going on right now? <laughs> I, you know, I, I think that there were some games that, that like took themselves super serious too back in the day. Um, like, that Aerosmith game. You remember that? Oh my God. Revolution. Revolution right? X. Yeah. Yeah. I remember being in the arcade and I remember like, I mean, I was a kid, you know, but I was, I was, I remember like watching somebody play that and Steven Tyler pops up and it's like, remember music is the weapon and you're shooting CDs at people. And I just, this is a stupid thing. Or, or did you remember uh, the PS one, uh, Will Smith apocalypse game? Do you remember that one? Oh, uh, what do you mean? Uh, the Bruce Willis, Bruce Willis. That's what I meant. Bruce Willis. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. I, I, I never played it, but I remember people saying it was terrible. And I remember wanting to play it because it was made by Neversoft. Mm-hmm. They, um, they had, like, such fun, like, ideas, like I said, back in the day, too. Like, uh, I don't know. Uh, finish your point. I'll, I'll, I'm just trying to think of the game right now off the top of my head. No, yeah, I remember I, it. I actually remember it. All the Doom clones, speaking of, like, another Doom clo- clones, do you remember a game called P.O.'d? Yes, I do. You you were a chef, weren't you? Yes, you were a chef, and yeah. you were fighting aliens with a frying pan and stuff. It, yeah. Just stuff like that, where it's just, like these these were like fun games, and you don't see that from like the big publishers anymore. You you see it a lot in the indie space still, thank God. But you still you just don't get that like random. I'm going to go to a store, hear something crazy, and I'm going to walk out like you used to. You know, Resident Evil's had some other unintentionally funny moments too, like. Uh... I know I talked about this one in Resident Evil Five when I was talking to the melee crew. I think we were, it was one of the um, off off YouTube ones, and I was talking about like you know Resident Evil Five doesn't just have like the boulder punch scene, but like when Wesker falls into the lava. Oh my god! He, yes, he's, you know, and he's like his his last word is just him going ah Kratos, <laughs> and he and he literally, literally sounds like something off of uh, South Park. And it's like it sucks because like DC Douglas is actually a pretty good voice actor when he when he when he like isn't phoning it in. Yeah. DC um, Douglas and then, is also a great personality. That guy really knows how to hold your attention. At, uh, have you ever seen him at cons and stuff? No, I, I haven't actually. He uh, is I, a riot. Yeah, I've wanted to because he voices my favorite Mass Effect character, which is Legion. Oh yeah, that's right. I forgot he is yeah. the voice actor of Legion. Yeah. I, I love uh, those then, games. Speaking of uh, unintentionally funny, I uh, sorry, I'll let you finish your point. I'll, I'll I was going to say the the scene in Resident Evil Code Veronica. Well, Code Veronica has some some funny moments, especially when you figure out like Albert and like or. Was it, what's his name? Albert Ashford, or is it Alfred? Ash- but when you find out that that he was cross dressing the whole time, but like <laughs> when when Steve locks himself in the oven, and you just hear him go, "Claire, help me!" I remember <laughs> my my buddy Troy and I put we put the controller down. I can't remember which one of us was playing, and just blew a fucking funny fuse because. <laughs> Like he locks himself in the oven, and then and then the whole reason he gets locked in the oven is that's where they stored the golden Uzis. Maybe I can't remember if it was an oven or not, but I remember like the room was like getting hot or something. Maybe it was filling with poison gas. But hmm. just all Claire, help me! I was like, did they get Jail White to voice him for that <laughs> one line? <laughs> yeah, but like uh, speaking of like another game that takes itself seriously, Mass Effect has some yeah. banger of uh comedy moments when you're playing as the dickhead shepherd i'm commander shepherd this is my favorite store in the citadel those are fun mm. ones but like <clears throat> when you're just like playing full-on racist shepherd and you're just walking around the citadel just like talking shit to all the aliens my favorite line from mass effect one is like uh you're on the citadel and when the hanar is like arguing with the cops and the cops like why won't it listen and you just go because it's a big stupid jellyfish and i'm just <laughs> <laughs> just like and the male shepherd like uh voice actor uh, he wasn't supposed to be the main voice actor, but he owns that role. Uh, like that's yeah, like I, the definitive one. I think Mark Mir is way better than Jennifer Hale. Not that Jennifer Hale's a bad voice actor, no, not at all. Stretch, but you know, and people were like always trying to to tell me like, no, she's the better Shepherd. And I was like, I I think I think he does a a great job. No, he he does. He blows it away. He owns it. Like Jennifer Hale, like she's professional. Like when you listen yeah. to her and like. She's given like some uh, things. It doesn't sound like she's like as loose with like the line, her uh, line delivery because she, she is, uh, you know, without a doubt, one of the best voice actresses of all time. Like I can honestly say yeah. that she's been in everything from like you know the Powerpuff Girls to just like every other video yeah. game. You know, it's like well, she was she was Cortana too, wasn't she? Uh no, she, I don't think she no, was oh, Cortana. She was Bastila. Yeah, that's Jen Taylor. Yeah, yeah Bastila. That's, that's who, who you're was. probably thinking of. Like 
Yeah. She she's famous and Mark Muir, I don't really know his work outside of Mass Effect, but the guy has such an iconic voice with Commander Shepard. Like he's like the voice of all the memes and everything too, you know? Yeah. Like it's just like uh thanks to uh, Game Poop, it's like you can never get rid of reports of ship. Well, bang, okay. <laughs> it's like you can't, you can't get rid of it. And and he and he loves it. And like every time he's like forced to say it, he's like, I I get in trouble every time for doing this, but I'll do it, you know. Uh, Mark Muir yeah, can he... be rather monotone in the first game, but he has grown into his role. It, it's weird that you say that, uh, Diablo. I I don't think he was as monotone as it was. More so, I guess, if you play the good route. But when you're playing like Dickhead Shepherd, he loves being a dickhead. You can tell. I mean, that's that's the best way to do it, though. I mean, like when you commit to it. Yeah, it's like, like that's what I mean. Like Jennifer Hale, yeah. like I said, she's very professional, but Mark Mears, she's like he, he's just going like full on. He's like I'm embracing the, the dickhead, you know, like talking shit to the Rex, telling everyone like it ain't gonna work like that. Especially like uh, Mass Effect Two, he's like, tell me what I want to know. Or I'm gonna cut your balls off and get it to a Krogan. You know, it's just like these are these are supposed to be intimidating lines, but he just like delivers it so well. I can't help but laugh. <laughs> it's. Yeah, and the um, the other the other thing too about Mass Effect was just that was also a game that really had moments of levity that that you don't get. You know, I mean, I I, I love Knights of the Old Republic. That was my first Bioware exposure. Then I played Jade Empire. Yes, yes, you're speaking my language. And um, you know, both of those games, like you know, every now and then in in um in those games, you'd find like like a sniveling character that was kind of like, eh, he's kind of funny. But you know, Mass Effect was the first the first game where they actually played into the humor quite a bit. Oh yeah. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, I think having Seth Green as Joker I'll, might open some of that up. Oh yeah, a Joker you know. was hilarious. Yeah, and and you know, not only was he hilarious, but you you also liked his character. He wasn't just there to be the butt of the joke. I mean, granted, in Mass Effect Three it kind of felt that way since he and Edie shacked up, but yeah, uh, you know. Uh, I, I I still even I, I still even enjoyed that they didn't take that you know too serious. It just was what it was. Like you mm-hmm. accepted it, but it was it was funny. But you also took it. You know, again, they, they they walked a good line there with it. I think. Yeah, exactly. And uh, another thing too is it didn't feel like he was playing uh, uh, Seth Green as Seth Green, like some right. of the voice actors. Right. Like he really embraced the role of Joker, and uh, definitely like him and Edie in the second game, they had some really funny comical moments too. That's for sure. Did Robot Chicken ever do any Mass Effect sketches? I don't think they did, actually. And if they yeah, did, that's a, that's I, I a missed shame. it. And yeah, no, apparently it never, it never happened. It might be contracts. That's probably why. Maybe. It's well, like... I mean, granted, you know, they, they kind of did everything. Yeah, yeah, that's another thing. Fuck Cartoon Network or, or William Street or whoever for giving that show the time slot of death. Yeah. Because it, I think it was they were like, oh, this show, it's, it's, it's aged on us. It's a little too edgy, even though, you know, if we still had the rights to air Family Guy, we'd still air those early seasons. Yeah. Oh, gee, when, I, when I think of Robot Chick, I love the darkest sketch episode. That's my favorite one. Oh, yeah, with the Tooth Fairy. And yeah. Then was, yeah. <laughs> darkest sketch. Darkest sketch. <laughs> it's like, sometimes comedy, like I said, just just has to be a right. well-written and, joke with a perfect payoff. And they did a good job making fun of everybody on Robot Chicken. Oh, yeah. S- some of the, like, yeah. the be- best skits are like... Uh, I think what it was Chris, uh, no, Kiss Saves Christmas. I think that was like one of their more favorite bits. I think Kiss Saves Christmas was Family Guy. No, I think they also redid that too with Phyllis Diller as uh, Mrs. Claus too before she passed away. I I can't remember. Or was it? But I know like they also did it, but they did like another one for like a Christmas special with like Kiss. (laughs) It's Kiss, you know? (laughs) They they had one with Gary Coleman that had me crying laughing. And I'm trying to remember what it was. Like he dies and and he ends up getting he ends up getting uh, reincarnated as a leprechaun and he gets <laughs> banked by the guy that played Mr. Drummond. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> oh man, there's some really good robot sketch. Uh, robot sketch. Excuse me, robot chicken sketches. Oh, that's what it was. They had him in the Inglorious Bastards sketch. And uh, yeah, he 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 plays a bad guy from World War Two. <laughs> we'll, let's, let's put it that way to make it YouTube safe, since yeah. we can say fuck this shit, all that. Uh, but uh, yeah, Inglorious Bastards with a Z, where 
everybody uh all all of the inglorious bastards were mentally handicapped put it that way <laughs> and uh yeah like the 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 one bad guy from world war 2 gets a uh the the uh the uh glaive from crawl carved into his forehead <laughs> and then and then they they piss off hitler by making him watch radio the cuba Cuddy <laughs> junior movie yeah, oh man there's there's so many good sketches from there. That that could be a whole different show, just like of all the references, especially uh, like the the toy collecting one when they had like the girl versions of the toys, and then it's just like it's like, and then they made a female Ninja Turtle, and then she OD'd and killed herself. <laughs> no, no one wanted to play with her anymore because the women don't care about their toys like men do. <laughs> That's right. They had the uh, the Michael Moore um, documentary about forgotten toys. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they have like Sailor Moon. It's like I sell my panties to Japanese older businessmen. It's like what the hell? You'll know when you're done, Shira. You'll know when you're done. <laughs> uh, Diablo coming in is. I realize these days that Seth Green isn't the cool hip guy anymore. He's a dude in his fifties. Time passing, feeling old. <laughs> yeah. It happens to us all. Yeah, it's just like I can just remember my mom like was not exactly the most well aware person of taking me to see like the most fucked up shows but it was like i remember seeing austin powers in theater and that's like the first time i remember seeing seth green and he's just like scott oh, yeah yeah and it's just like it's so weird to think about it's like man i remember when you were just like a like a character on like or on buffy and he was a, like a yeah. teenager or yeah. like or like i recently just found out like uh, michael Sarah was like a voice actor on braceface do you ever remember braceface yeah and I, yeah. that that blows that blows my mind. It's um, uh, the craziest one is Stephen Crowder is the voice of the brain on Arthur. Yeah, I know. That's yeah. that's so weird. Or um, uh, Jack Nickel uh, Jack Nicholson is also in like uh, a Vincent Price movie. That was like one of his first roles. Holy shit! You know, one of the craziest ones is one of Sean Connery's last appearance was playing Uncle Chuck on the uh, like that third Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon they made. Oh no, that's that's. That's wild, you know? That's, yeah. That's actually wild to think about. I'm like, wait, wait, the Sean Connery? Yeah. yeah. Or or it's like Vincent Price was on Scooby-Doo. <laughs> you remember that? That made, that made sense. I mean, it, at least, like, it was horror-ish related. Yeah, but it's still you know? it's still wild to think about. It's like, man, Vincent Price, the famous movie actor, like, did a whole oh. thing. Or he was on Batman. He was a villain in Batman. Yeah. Well, to to take yeah, he was he was egghead. Yes, that's even more yeah. fucking weird. <laughs> yeah, because it's like he had nothing to do with Harry. He's just a guy with a big fucking head. Yeah. Um. Yeah. You know, the craziest one for me always is, and as a Transformers fan, you know, uh, Orson Welles being one of the most prestigious actors and directors of all time. Is yeah. One of his final roles was being the giant planet-eating Transformer Unicron. That is so weird to also think yeah. about. I forgot about that. I remember. I think what uh, AVG was talking about that. You yeah. Know? So I, I I still love. Have you ever seen the the the? I mean, I'm sure everybody's seen it, but the the outtakes from that wine commercial he did. No, I did not. Oh my god, you got to watch it. He he's it was Paul. It was like a cheap wine because like I, I guess he I guess he probably wasn't the best with his money, so he's taking whatever roles he could at the end right. of his life. And it was like people were like, "Hey, Orson Welles, but you got a big name, Citizen Kane," and he's it, you know he gets drunk in the wine commercial. <laughs> <laughs> and they have all the outtakes. Some out of the French. They know wine. Uh, is, uh, and he keeps interrupting me. It's, it's fantastic. You gotta watch it. I, I uh, you'll have to send that to me later on. I'll yeah. watch it later on if you can. Just oh, it's 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 easy to find. Yeah. Oh man, oh man, that's so wild to think about. It's just it's it's wild to think about like just how oh, many it's champagne. Oh, champagne, even better. Yeah. I don't like champagne. It's, Do you like champagne? I, I like it every now and then. Like, if I'm at a wedding, it's like, um, yeah, I'll have a glass. But I'm, I'm never going to be like, you know what? I could go for a glass of champagne right now. Uh, I, I, I can never get used to it. It's just And and just the Venture bad. Brothers also ruined champagne for me a little bit. <laughs> With the Monarchs line is like, you think you're hot shit? In a champagne glass when really you're just warm diarrhea in a Dixie cup. <laughs> so now whenever I think of champagne, I think of someone shitting in a Dixie cup. I just think of Dr. Girlfriend. That I, that never has left my mind. <laughs> oh, Monarch. I just like, this is so funny. Just, it's just I'm like... leaving you for Melee James. He knows how to treat a woman. 
He's got that blue saxophone Eminem. <laughs> and he can get it all the way in there. Oh, man. Just the early 2000s, I think, was like the last hurrah of pop culture. I really do believe that. Yeah, I, I think there's a, I think there's a chance for it to come back. I mean, you know, going back to, you know, we my, my wife and I see a lot of comics mm -hmm. and comedy is not dead. There's still an audience for it. The powers that be are trying to suppress anything that they find, quote unquote, edgy or offensive. Yeah. But people there's still an appetite for it. And I, I you know, when I see. I, you know, I've been a lifelong console gamer. I don't hate consoles. I still have my consoles. I still mm -hmm. buy games on consoles. But oh, yeah. like, when I when you go to the PC market, man, is there an open marketplace for ideas and innovation and experimental stuff? Are the budgets there? Not always. But I mean, where else are you gonna find stuff like Cuckold Simulator? Oh or, my God, I couldn't believe yeah. that. Shout out Zaytos yeah. over there. She was playing that on Rumble. <laughs> I just couldn't yeah. believe it. You know, like team team seventeen, man. Like they they do the most outrageous oh, things. Yes. And you know, it sucks because you start to see, especially in the sweet baby drama, you're starting to see some some people trying to get their tendrils into Steam. Mm -hmm. But Steam is like the like a big bad. You know, at least Gog exists. And if Steam and Gog go, somebody else is gonna be like, you know what? We're just gonna have a launcher or a repository without DRM for the yep. most wacky and insane games because there's a hunger for them. There's an audience for them. Uh, Genital Jousting was like the first <laughs> game that really, really caught my attention. Like, wait a minute, you play as a, as a, as a, a, um, uh, sentient dick. Yeah. With a butt on the end of it. And the goal is to get the head in the, the butt of another, you know, it, just the craziest shit exists on PC, and I'm I'm here for it. I love it, and you know I've like I, sometimes I'll go on there like when James is streaming, I'll try and find like the the most ridiculous game I can find, and that's like how I found Fart Girl for him. Um, uh, then you know like Gay World, Tyrone versus the Cops, those sort of things. Um, you know even there's 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 less offensive stuff like I am bread and surgeon simulators mm -hmm. another one that's like ridiculous I think goats all this all the simulators genre uh, it's either something that's legitimate or just completely ridiculous yes indeed. and um, you know I, I I absolutely love the fact that there's a free market of ideas and people aren't constricted by studios uh, they're, they're running with their imagination people can even take foundations with the mods and the mod scene's been a thing since i was a kid because when was what was the first mod you ever saw out of curiosity uh, it was definitely all the fallout mods that's for sure mm -hmm. i mean not the fall not just the fallout mods but the half-life mods mm -hmm. the that's... first mod i ever saw when i was a kid this it was like it was either 93 or 94 my this kid i, I was friends with named chris he's like my brother donnie has a has doom but you kill barney the dinosaur and i was like no way <laughs> And I mean, this was the, back in the day when he had to go to some computer convention and people were selling Doom mods on floppy disks because dial up just wasn't even readily available for for most people or affordable. Uh, like, you know, the good old days. we got we got dial up in 95. I remember. And I remember going into an AOL chat room for the first time. It was the most wholesome thing back in the day because I went into like Nickelodeon chat room. It was like, hi, guys. I'm I don't, on the I don't even think Nickelodeon was as wholesome now. Have you seen that documentary? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Uh, you know. Oh, I'm uh, Captain Howdy. How are you doing? Oh, fuck. Crazy that. <laughs> Crazy that they got the rights to the uh, to the uh, Ninja Turtles when they had the head of the Foot Clan all along. Exactly. Hey yo. Do -do -ch. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. You know, it's funny. Like uh, you know, going back to like what I was doing with like bombing super chats. I was in DJ DJ Axis's stream last night, and he he like his he he like uh, started talking about Nickelodeon Gak. So I started super chatting him as Dan Schneider. God damn. <laughs> I haven't heard this many Gak references since I was on the Nickelodeon casting couch. Oh Jesus, Gak! I that's that's a way back reference too. Yeah, <laughs> it's got a whole different meaning now, but back then, <laughs> yeah, we we marketed it so if there were stains on your clothes, people wouldn't think twice. Yeah, it's 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 just so weird. But like going back to like a comedy and stuff, what well, I feel like it's just another thing too is right now what we're dealing with. It's not only just like, you know, it's corp companies doing this, that, and the other thing. It's also we don't have the same level of creative people still in the industry, you know? At least mainstream. Yeah. Like, 
you know, you, you, you saw Legion of Skanks, um, you know, Come Town. Um, Ryan Long is also fantastic. The sketches that he does are, are great. You know, you got guys like J.P. Sears out there. I mean, there there are there are people. It's just the problem is they're not mainstream. They're not getting exposed. And, I, you know, I talked about Conan O'Brien earlier and seeing this stuff. That was on NBC. And, you know, that's – it's like the normie – it's like they're, they're keeping this stuff away from the normies. They're, like, yeah. keep keeping it from the normies. You know, there's, there's like, an element to that that's a good thing in a way, and then there's an element like it's bad. I wish everybody else could laugh at the stuff we're laughing at, you know? Yeah. Well, it's, 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 sorry, go on, yeah. finish your point. I was going to say, comedy is a unifying force, and mm-hmm. I feel like they want the laughter to be one-sided, and it's not just, a, it's not just you know, on the left. There's people on the right that want laughter to be one-sided. Well, yeah. And, I, I think that we're in this state where games, movies, music, and comedy, um, TV, everything, even 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 marketing, you know, they're they're turning it into this divisive thing, and it shouldn't be. These are th- sports too. These oh, yeah. are things that used to unify us and bring us together. And you know, we need to have opportunities to laugh at each other and and cheer for each other and boo for each other. But at the end of the day, like not hate one another. And I think that's, that's one of the things that's just lacking. And, and comedy is just such a unifying force that if we started with the ability to learn to laugh at things that we agree with and disagree with. Yeah. Um, well, you, you know, know, like uh, as an observation, it's also the younger generation. They, mm-hmm. they don't understand. Like we, we grew up in a Bush years. All right. So we know yeah. like, and you grew up more in like the Reagan years with the Satanic Panic and the moralism yeah, and and, all that and, stuff. and Bush one and Clinton and I mean I, I guess you know more so the things I remember you know were were from the Clinton years. Yeah, well, same yeah. thing for me. But I like my more of my formative years were definitely the Bush years too. You know, with the with the whole thing where they were covering up the statues and everything. Yeah, to, because you can't have the small little Greek penis be shown. But yeah. it's it's. What but what we had was we had a culture that like was pushing back on this stuff yeah. too, you know. And I remember just like being on Twitter, like uh, people, like young people, don't actually understand. It. They're like, "Oh well, how how did the Bush regime let some of these shows through?" And it's Go. like they had like a TV show called Little Bush, you know, like coming. Yeah, Central they had Pat- that Bush, yeah, with the South Park guys. Yeah, and it's. It's like, listen, you could, like, you were able to make fun of everyone. Like, yeah. Bill Clinton was, like, the punchline of everyone. How many people said, like, man, if... He made fun of one of Animaniacs. Yeah. It's like, oh, man, you know, it's, I don't care if he's getting his dick sucked if my taxes are low. It's like every comedian had that joke, you know? Yeah. It's like, because we understand, it's like, you can mock these people, but then it's just like something happened where, um, like, the younger generation doesn't understand. It's like... We have all this stuff that's going on where you could have, like, comedy. It's like, like the Bush regime wasn't, like, going around censoring, like, anime and all that stuff. Like, there were people yeah. who were doing that, but it's like – but it's, it's like I remember – Well, I mean, Al, Al Gore's wife was one of the most censorious people. Yeah, yeah exactly. Gore. It was a, it was a know, bipartisan issue for that one. What the fuck happened to D. Snyder where now he's siding with the people that used to try and censor his music, you know? <laughs> Hold on a second. I got I to address this uh, inside joke from our uh, stream. First off, Satello, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, first off, Grim does not hate minorities. It's women. All right? Get it right. <laughs> so uh, just to give you a little heads up on this one. We have a buddy. Like, I had him on my show. His name is uh, Grim. And uh, I've, I've been making a joke that uh, he doesn't like romance in games. He's just a big gameplay guy. So, like, I've been mocking him and saying, it's like, feelings are for women, and I hate women. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's, that's where that comes from. Oh, my bad. See? Yeah, that's right. He doesn't hate minorities. He's not a racist. He's a sexist. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, as getting back to the point uh, where I was saying that, it's like, they, these people are like, I don't understand how Ghost in the Shell could get on, where it was criticizing America. I'm like, you could mm. criticize America, you know? Well, now everybody does. Yeah. You know? To, to an outrageous extent, I think, for the most part on some of the stuff. But it's really when, you know, I don't I don't try to make this, like, political in terms of, like, you know, I hate both sides. That's where I stand, where my politics are. I think it's just yeah. I believe in common sense, and I don't care who says it. If they make a fucking argument that's stupid, I want a meme on it at this point. Yeah, and, and same. It's, it's, it's like I, I just – I want the best outcome for everybody. I, I want – 
I, and you know, even if we even if we disagree on something, I, I still want to be able to like find common ground. And exactly. I think that's the thing is is people just start hating each other over the the most minute disagreements anymore. Even even down to like, oh, you like this comic book? Fuck you! Yeah, you, right. we, we, you know. And it's... How I always look at this type of argument, it's like there are people like people are friends with whoever they want to be friends with. Yeah. There are, I, I don't like everyone that my pe- my friends are friends with, all right? It's just the reality oh, of the situation. Yeah. But I I think, like, when people go online and all that stuff, I'm like, I don't assume everyone that goes online is a terrible person. I just yeah. think they made a terrible argument, and then it's unfortunate that they were the, they're were they they're now the figurehead, and they that terrible argument is what they always will point to, and then it's like, fuck, man. It's like... I yeah. I agree with this person, but they made a bad argument, and now the people I disagree with are always going to just say like, "This is me." I, I think too. I, I've had this conversation with DJ Axis too. I think the most boring people online are the people that make their entire personality devoted to hating one person, and I think the most boring people online are the people that are completely obsessed with Dark Side Phil. Like Dark Side Phil is like what would happen if the Truman Show uh, was was. Uh, I, I guess it's like the it's like idiocracy crossed with the Truman Show. The right. guy is the most boring motherfucker to ever walk the planet. He's bad with money. He jerked off on stream once. That was funny, actually. He jerked off on stream twice, but you know that's the second <laughs> time. Maybe. But it's like beyond that, it's like okay, you guys are just looking at a functional retard that somehow has a wife and is uh, is kept afloat by the 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 people that feel sorry for him and by echoing it. By echoing him and everything he does, you're keeping him afloat. He's not like Chris Chan, like, oh and, and even there, like, Chris Chan's a different story because I, I think people just like walk. There were some people like Blue Spike that like really antagonized the guy, uh, but like he was just like a walking, walking, talking train wreck. There was there was some interest in that because he would do and say completely absurd stuff. And I, I think a lot of the the fascination with Chris wasn't from a place of hate. Yeah, there were people that were trolling him, but nobody was doing stuff that was like what I, I consider to be hateful. But going back to DSP, there's just so many people that like their entire online personality is picking up on the, the little teeny tiny things that this guy says that are just so fucking boring. Yep. And it's like by doing this by proxy you are making yourself boring what are you contributing to a space like when i make memes i don't make memes i don't beat a dead fucking horse over the same fucking thing you know <laughs> you know there's all there's like only a certain you know even like like you know we had the running joke on the melee stream with with um steve balmer i can't come on every every melee st- stream and start going developers evolve. eventually that runs its course oh, exactly that, you got to keep it fresh and it's not just having a short attention. It's not just a matter of having a short attention span. It's just keeping things fresh, moving stuff along, giving people something new to laugh at. Yeah. Uh, and and I just think that people are just in this perpetual state. And it's not just people. It's society. Like we have so many remakes and sequels. It's yep. just like people are so fixated on on something they're comfortable with to the point where it becomes completely boring and people are comfortable and you have so many stan account too where they'll make a video game or tv show look at all the, the people right now that have 97 and the x logo in there because they got a show for it or ghostbusters mm-hmm. or whatever so fanboys like, let's just go yeah. what is they're fanboys console cucks as i like to call them I, yeah i, I hate I, them I, so I, much they all should yeah. be made fun of relentlessly <laughs> exactly and it's just like if we could poke fun at these people in a, in a way like look what you're doing is 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 dumb you know come on like redeem yourself a little bit I, but no it's yeah. just I, I, you know, it's like I, it's like i told you earlier you know like i said these people have never had conflict in their life they've just right they've just been consumed and it's it's funny because it's like when you know fernando and i will make the the meme of like just somebody being a cuck where it's like we put their face on you know uh, a guy holding some uh, his wife's hand and she's getting plowed by a black guy and it's just like you know it's like this is what you are you're you're just a corporation cuck it's like you have yeah. replaced your entire personality with being like devoted to a billion dollar company and yeah. I feel like um that's that's the problem is is that these people have replaced their personality with being a brand a consumer their identity they have nothing interesting about their lives. And instead of just like trying to be like a person like you and I, we're just like, we want to be a person. We're having a conversation. It's they want their identity to be their personality. And their identity is I'm an Xbox fan. I'm a PlayStation fan. Like, let's just keep it on brand with video games. It's like, I am simping 
for some of the most evil companies in the world that have constantly screwed me over and fucked me over and treat me bad. But instead of like, you know, valuing uh, being a human and trying to stand up for people, uh, instead, I'm going to stand up for like a multi billion dollar company. It's like these people yeah, with the thing. Capcom stuff, you know, with the microtransactions. Right. It's right. like, I get it. I understand your point. It's like they are optional for the most part, they don't add anything to the game. This is well, nothing what happened new. To us, like, when Bethesda used to be a cool company, everybody in unison was like, no, fuck horse armor. That's stupid. Yeah. If you buy the horse armor, you're an idiot. And, you know, now it's just people are like, oh, well, you know, it is what it is. I hate that saying so much. I I, I say it is what it is. You, you have my permission to slap me. I, I, I can't help it because I'm also kind of in that sense because it's like I'm not going to buy them. I'm going to tell people not to, like, that they shouldn't do this. But at the same time, it's so hard because of how fucked up gaming is right now on some levels where it's like, we want everything to be better, but then complete. Yes. But it's mm-hmm. like here for me. So let's just go with a little thing that we had earlier today. We were, uh, when I was on nerdy Neo, Mark was talking about, uh, Hellblade two. Mm-hmm. And his point was that like, he did feel like, uh, they kind of didn't, they over promised a little bit in their marketing and they weren't upfront about it. And I kind of like my kind of more pushback on this one. It was, it was friendly. I wasn't being a dick about it too. I mean, cause I understand his point. It's, it's a solid point. You can have it. There's nothing wrong with it. But then it's like, you gotta look at like, we look at the bigger picture of gaming where if Hellblade two was coming out and they charged you $70 for it instead of 40, they would complain that the game was too short and they were overcharging you for it. And then we go to, like, a game like, say, Spider-Man 2. Mm-hmm. Spider-Man 2 uh, got covered by the media for all of its broken buggy mess nightmare that it was. But on top of that, too, $70. The game cost, like, $300 million to make. And yeah. then with all the Insomniac leaks that we're seeing, you see that Disney is, like, taking massive amounts of money from every game sale, mm-hmm. console sale. And on top of that, too, it's, like, the licensing fee that they had to put mm-hmm. on it. And from the FTC document leaks... You're seeing, like, The Last of Us and Horizon uh, Zero Dawn. They cost, like, $200 million to make. Yeah. You know? The the razor-thin profit margins that it goes into putting that much money in there and to you sell know, the product. I, I think that there's there's two problems with, with these budgets. And two problems that people don't want to talk about is, one, they need to audit how they're spending their money. Yes. And when when... I say that they need to audit, like, how much are they spending on consultants? How much are they spending on minute details that people, the average gamer, is not going to care about? Mm-hmm. Um, and the other one goes to everything they, they make. They're like, okay, we need to make a game that's, like, uh, you know, X amount of hours. And I would rather have a game that is not open world with good level design, yep. an, an eight to nine hour experience, than a hundred hour experience that's just mostly padding and and three to four memorable hours of gameplay. Oh yes. Like, I, I guess it's a a, a, a a you know a, a, a trifold issue too because I I don't mind story in games. Like to me, the perfect amount of story in a game is Doom twenty sixteen. <laughs> nice. I'm dead serious too. Like I love Doom. I I I I don't hate Doom Eternal, but I love Doom twenty sixteen. And it just gave you enough little story bits to keep you engaged in the environment. And it worked, too, because Doom 2016 didn't have, you know, it had a problem with repetitive environments here and there. Yeah. And, um, but the, the little bits you get with Olivia Pierce and Samuel Hayden and the Doom guy just not giving a fuck. Yep. Like, when when Hayden starts monologuing and the Doom guy just goes, you know, and then kicks M- the monitor Gordon out. And then soundtrack like, kicks in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They are putting way too much of an emphasis on a story in a game because all these people feel like, oh, I, 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 I grew up on Hideo Kojima. Fuck Hideo Kojima. Fuck man. Hideo Kojima. Thank you. <laughs> Fuck him. Fuck him. Death Stranding was the most pretentious piece yes. of shit. Yes. Played my... If you like that game, great. I don't think no. badly Fuck of you. you. If you like that a... game, you're an asshole. You're but... part of the problem. <laughs> well, they are part of the problem if, if you're defending, especially if you're defending the game. But, you know, I. I, I I, I it's like I I play games to play games. I watch movies for a story. I, yes. I'll read for a story. Yes. And I think that 
this whole idea okay games have overtaken hollywood that's just a, a factor but mm -hmm. it's not about them replacing hollywood it's about them being a companion to it and, and they've lost the plot and trying to turn these games into movies and that's bloating the budget so it's, yes. it's like going back to devolver what's the thing we like most about devolver it's the gameplay yeah but and, and you don't need a big budget for that but and like, hellblade yeah but i like i just want sorry to derail you but then the problem is we gamers like i've seen this argument said that from a lot of times like uh they make the argument where it's like well gameplay is so good and fun but then it's just like well i i think it's holding the industry back when you make everything look like earthbound or a, a spunky like mm. ps2 uh, or 8-bit kind of game or something did, did you play spider-man 2 Oh yeah, I got the platinum trophy for it. And same, it was an easy plat. And yes. that's, that's the funny part too, is that like for, for they're like, well, if you hated the game, how'd you platinum it? It was a very easy platinum. Yes, uh, it's because it's um, like I like the gameplay. It was right. It wasn't bad. I can say that, uh, but like the story is just bad. I had a lot yes. of glitches, and it's unacceptable. And if you're yeah. seeing like some of the other stuff that's coming out, it's like they've rushed it out. You know, if they had got rid of the stuff with the Emily May Foundation. And just focused on the symbiote story and mm -hmm. Craven. In yes. fact, they shouldn't even had the symbiote story in there. Yes. It should have just been let's adopt Craven's last hunt, but with Miles. Yeah, and, and leave the Mysterio stuff in there because the Mysterio stuff was great because it was gameplay. Yes, it was Going fun in, too. Yeah, rest and and somebody like tried to like when you did the music mission. Am I wrong here? But I like the first thing I did after I got all the instruments. They put you in that museum. I'm like, I don't care. About First the history off, of these I instruments. hated that mission so much. I did because, too. Because like that's like the one thing I point to when people go like, "Oh, you know, th this game is not woke. You can't point to anything in there." I'm like, they literally have a mission of a white man stealing black history. It's like it's so yeah. on the nose. Like it's it's not even funny. And it, on top of that too, it's like you are putting it onto the half black character, and you're making this like a big part of his story. And it's just like it's very on the nose. It it doesn't feel like you did it as like a genuine thing. Right. It feels like you forced this on here because like if you're like a normie, you don't understand what's like like what is going on. But then you look into the DEI sessions that they have at Insomniac, the Sweet Baby Inc. Yep. involvement and all this stuff. It's like it doesn't feel as natural as it could have been. Like they could well, like a good writer could have made something interesting from that. But Even bad the, writers make propaganda, is like what right. I like to call it. And propaganda is so on your nose. Like, you just go back in history and, like, you watch, like, any person that, like, puts out, like, propaganda. It's like you could tell, like, what it is, you know? Yeah. Even the Emily May Foundation, it's like you're in the building for, like, 45 minutes and, and it's so hand-holdy and you can't skip it. Mm -hmm. And they're giving you, like, all these pie-in-the-sky green ideas that just are not feasible and why do I need to know about any of this? Why Why is this, you know, again, if, if you're like, and, and how much of the budget did that cost to have all these sequences? Okay, we're going to yeah. have a voice actor, and we've rendered all this stuff on a, on a computer screen. Back in the day, in the, or in the PlayStation 2 era, what would have happened? Peter and Harry would have walked into the building, and they would have gone right to Harry's office. Okay, Pete, yeah, we're going to do our startup. Here's submissions. Yeah, but that's yeah. also, like, a big issue I'm having with PlayStation games, too, because they've yeah. been doing that. Like, and I, I, I go with this where I think Sony got overpraised in the last generation because, mm -hmm. let's face it, the Wii U was a tremendous flop, and Microsoft had to always deal with a uphill PR battle. It took Microsoft until 2017 to have, like, some sort of semblance of, like, what the hell they were going to do. Mm -hmm. And... Sony. A lot of that came with backwards compatibility. Like that was the yeah. the best goodwill that they got coming out of Don Matrick into Phil Spencer. And then yep. I think Phil Spencer's a piece of shit. I think Jim Ryan's a piece of shit too. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, but um, yeah, I, I, but I like, agree. But but on top of that too, it's like 2018 was like when everything kind of like started was like the first I thought was going to be good shift for the game industry because that's when Microsoft finally went out and they said we're going to actually try to make first party games are going to try to right and get stu and studio acquisitions but yes. nobody nobody saw what happened with rare is writing on the wall yeah but at the same time yeah. it's like how many studios are japan like studio japan's yeah. now gone studio london's gone uh you and know. it's just santa monica is their main studio and that's that's a problem yeah and even look at all the toxic stuff that's been going on at naughty yeah. dog and everything too yeah it, it's like 
you know, like everyone kind of says, like uh, these people, are like can, like I don't fully agree with you on Phil Spencer being a piece of shit. I feel like Phil Spencer is like he was there, and he's trying to save the business side of making video games for Microsoft. I I don't think he actually believes in game preservation, and I don't believe that he actually has a vision for what they're going to do with these studios. And I I'm a I'm a very outspoken critic of Games Pass because. You know, I, I see it when people say it's the Netflix of gaming. Yeah. I, I, I see that as um, a really negative thing because, you know, the Netflix the Netflix of gaming implies that they're going to have the Netflix originals of gaming. And mm-hmm. you know that those are um, typically like, look, I know I know there's some people, my wife included, that love Netflix originals, but I think that they're mostly trash. And I don't consume anything on Netflix because I think that it's mostly trash content. And I think that, you know, their first party games have really suffered under that banner. Like, Halo Infinite could have been a good game. Ah, uh, that that's definitely but a 343 nightmare. Did you see all that story? It, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I stand by this one. I'm like, I don't understand why fucking Bonnie Ross gets so much love from the game industry when the lady has done nothing but run a studio and a franchise into a ground so consistently, you know, and and she was a higher up at, uh, you know, uh, uh, Microsoft and everything too, because when Phil Spencer would go on trips and stuff before, like, uh, they had more structure in their environment. She was like the person who took over for studios and was like answering Mm -hmm. emails and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I like, I, I, don't think phil spencer is jesus but i don't think phil spencer is like the problem i think the problem is that it's microsoft well yeah microsoft at at at, at, you know he's he's more or less the figurehead but i i I do think that you know he comes out looking smug and he doesn't actually address what they're doing to fix the lack of games or to make them a viable platform and also i think that a lot of this move to cloud should be questioned oh it should be um, but that, you know that's if, if you're gonna say I, i'm here for games preservation great um what are you doing to make these games permanently available for people i mean the fact that it came down to backwards compatibility and this is one of the things that scares me and i i don't want to derail too much no by but, the way so we can talk you know I like love this. backwards compatibility for certain games is, is is not there like jet set radio future is mm-hmm kind of locked to the xbox and xbox 360 because they're like oh to make it backwards compatible we'd have to relicense the music yeah why well you know what let's just be more honest with this one too sega is they're making it again (laughs) that's that's the well yeah sega is probably going to re-release it and and no they they're remaking it didn't you see it oh they're they're completely remaking it. yes i I thought they were just making a new one yeah they 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 basically said they're going to kind of like remake it they're well they're due, Bomb but, Rush Cyberpunk ate their lunch, so that they kind of have to. That is a great game, too. It's yeah. a serious asphalt. <laughs> yeah, and, and also it innovated on it. Like, you have skateboards. You can be on foot. There's combat. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it didn't just say, we're, we're just going to cr- make a new Jet Set Radio or Jet Grind Radio. We're, we're going to take the concept, and we're going to expand upon it. Um, understand the concept of love. Yeah. <laughs> That's 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 a good reference right there. Mm-hmm. How many times did, I, did, you, did you sit on that menu screen? Oh, I have the soundtrack. I listen to the soundtrack. Nice. I have it on my iTunes, and I'll just play it every now and then. Uh, is is Dragula on the soundtrack? Ah, uh, no. This is like the official one without the okay. license tracks. Well, yeah, that was that was like one of the weirdest fucking things. I remember playing that with again that buddy Troy I mentioned. I remember we were playing the game, and it, just, it was so out of place when Dragula kicked in. We we're like, what? I mean, granted. Back in 99, that song was everywhere. It was even in the first Matrix movie. But, you know, it's like if you're for games preservation, why not push to have for games to have the same, I, I guess, publishing rights as movies? Like, imagine if, like, they're like, hey, we're going to, you know, it's Scarface's uh, 50th anniversary or 40th. How old Scarface now? It's probably 41. Oh, like, it, even, even that Scarface yeah. we're thinking about was actually a remake of an older Well, yeah, thing. the movie from the 40s, yeah. Yeah. But, like, the thing that I think, may, other than Pacino's performance, the thing, the other thing that makes Scarface so iconic is the soundtrack. Mm-hmm. And imagine if they're like, yeah, we couldn't get the rights to push it to the limit, so we put a new song in there. Or, you know, games need to have the same protections that movies have in terms of preservation. Uh, but granted, that's even becoming a slippery slope as, like, even Sony has gone and, and you know, oh, it's a minor change, but... They there's no <laughs> way to get the theatrical version of Across the Spider Verse anywhere. Yeah, you know, 
Uh, and with with digital movies, they're altering them. And and I always mm-hmm. bring up Skullgirls. Skullgirls is a game that's going on 13 years old, and they censored it retroactively. Oh wow! Yeah, they like. Oh, we had to remove offensive Im- imagery. Well, why do you care? You're you're not a Skullgirls player. No, I I care because of the precedent. Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, just to catch up on a couple chats here, uh, Diablo's checking in again. Variety is the spice of life. We have space for AAA games with grand stories. Also have a space for smaller indie platformers. We have a space for porn games, naturally. Well, you know, there was a time when developers, and I was listening to somebody the other day talking about that. There was a time, I, I, I wish I could remember off the top of my head, I think it might have been Game Ranks. It might have been Jake Baldino or, or Falcon talking about it. Where you would have companies like Capcom, I think it was Falcon in his Dragon's Dogma review. Mm-hmm. He was talking about that there was a time when Capcom would release smaller games and AAA games, and yes. I think that's something that Sony and Microsoft and all these big studios have forgotten that they have the ability to do. See, now I'm going to kind of give, give you a little pushback on that one too, because I want to say that, ironically speaking, that's kind of like one of the fun things I've noticed about Game Pass is that we got to see a lot of these studios go out and try to make some of these smaller games. Obsidian but, like, made Pentiment. They've made Grounded. We saw that failed uh, Ninja Theory game. Um, that was the uh, mobile. I, I know game. you're talking about that. that um, yeah. Um, a Bleeding Edge. Bleeding Edge. Bleeding that's what edge, it was. Yeah. That, that, which is basically, you pay 99 cents now for a coaster. And, basically, yeah. And, and you see these smaller games come out, and I, I like when they do it. And then they need they need marketing, and that's Microsoft's yes, big problem. That is a hundred percent. You are one hundred percent right there, my friend. They, they don't market those games, and I, and part of me thinks is like, do they want to market them? Because like there was a time when Sony used to that. Remember Flow and Journey, mm-hmm. and where are those sort of games coming from? Sony now, you know, but they're, they, they're in... Sony doesn't market their smaller stuff either, too. Now that's the problem. You're right. They they don't. But I I also think that they've kind of given up on making that stuff. And and meanwhile, like the Devolver games are are making making money. I, yeah. I think Nintendo does a decent enough job with some of their smaller games. Yes. Um, uh, I think from the FTC leaks too, they were saying mm-hmm. that in terms of profit margins, out of the big three, uh, Nintendo is the best at maximizing their profits. No, yeah. but Nintendo also I think is is one of the things that. I like about their games is the story doesn't get in the way of the gameplay. A hundred percent. You know, and that, that keeps me engaged. It's like, I, I, I still say like the best game I played all last year is Mario wonder. I know it's not everybody's cup of tea, mm. but for me, it's like right under super Mario world in terms of 2d Mario's. I, I, I love I was sad when I a hundred percented it because I was like, I, I, I just, I never wanted it to end. Yeah. Um, and, and, but, like, uh, and like we're talking about too, it's like, there is still a lot of creativity. Like we may be, oh, yeah. do, we've been talking doom and gloom, but like I said, last year, Two of my favorite games came out last year. One of them was from Tango Gameworks, which is the number one was uh, Hi-Fi Rush. I mm-hmm. absolutely adore that game, and I'm happy that pe- uh, more people are playing it now because it got a PlayStation port finally. Yeah. But another game that I really loved too was uh, Dave the Diver too. You mm-hmm. know, I, I I love that game. I've bought that game for so many people because of Steam sales. I I stand by it, and these aren't like super over the top heavy budgeted games i think hi-fi yeah. rush at most was 30 and then on top of that too david diver never gets as high as 25 and i bought it for 12 bucks neither of those games either and, and you know i think people get so hung up on graphics and and specs and everything but mm-hmm. neither of those games are are demanding like you could literally play them on anything for yes. the most part you and- know hi-fi rush you know might need a, a newer pc but i think if even if you had something that like you know if you had like a 1050 you can play that game no problem right and i and like when you're talking about like art style like i do not like the sony uh last of us like super real yeah, neither do style. I. it's it's nice don't get me wrong i'm not going to say that it looks like dog shit because it does look nice i will give them like that but i like the tim burton-esque the weird the cell shade the I like yeah. the Borderlands art style. I like the Psychonauts art style from Tim Schafer. The like well, you stuff know, like you that. You know what makes the Sony art style, I think, the worst? Is what? the fact that you can tell who's an NPC and who's not. Because you can tell that that's where they draw lines on the budget. Is that <laughs> their NPCs do not look like real people. Right. And they're real people now. They're trying to get self-inserts from the developers and people that worked on the game that one lady can claim all she wants that she didn't influence Mary Jane's redesign, but it's 
come on, it's plain as day. I mean, yes, it's 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 out there, but it's like one of those things where it's like there's a lot of no. circumstantial evidence, but you can never do it, and that's yeah. that's what makes a good conspiracy theory. Don't get me wrong, yeah. I love it. Yeah, you know, <laughs> but you know, when you get those games like Psychonauts and Hi-Fi Rush, uh, Bomb Rush, Cyberpunk, uh, all yes. games, they all have like NPCs that look like they're supposed to be part of the world. You can't tell who's an NPC and who's, you know, who's a, a you know, a, a, well, I mean, who's not a main character. Like, they, right. there's no disconnect there. I mean, that that really pulls me out of the experience when I see somebody and they look like they're from the PlayStation Two era in a PlayStation Five game. Yes. You yes, I, I guess the word that I would put for my my uh, view on this is that those games have soul. Yes, you know, like like when I play like God of War or something, it's like I I get Kratos, I get the story. I hate the second one in Ragnarok. I hate it so much, but I I, I hated Ragnarok too, man. I, I loved twenty eighteen. Uh, I know? did too. I love Spider Man twenty eighteen. Like... Those were all great. Yeah, you know? I didn't like Kratos. Kratos. <laughs> Kratos. But at the end, he's like, I could be more. You know, and then the scene where he's like weeping about a trace. It's like, dude, your your daughter and your first wife were brutally killed by you, and you didn't bitch out like this. Come on. I mean, kind of did. He murdered everyone, and then he murdered everyone, but he didn't sit there <laughs> sobbing like. In, I'm like, come, come on. I man. mean, let's let's just also call a spade a spade. Uh, the yeah. developers who wrote the story for God of War 2018 just took their story for Lost Planet three and said, let's just put it in God of War. <laughs> you know. Let's just let's just tell the truth of what it is. If you want to play uh, the exact same game with the exact same story, go play uh, Lost Planet Three. <laughs> I yeah, you know, I never played Lost Planet Three. Yes, every like look it up. Uh, a lot of the dev and writing team that worked on Lost Planet Three are uh, work at Sony Santa Monica when they made God of War. Yeah, that's a little fun fact for everyone there. <laughs> I mean, I, I did really like the, the story in, in twenty eighteen. I thought the the Balder stuff was interesting, and again, yes. that was a game too that. The story was there, and it moved. It moved you along. It helped progression, mm -hmm. but it didn't hinder the the experience. It didn't hinder the gameplay. Like I didn't find myself going like, ah, oh, yeah, I, uh, you know, I'm gonna sit here and watch a 45 minute Hideo Kojima s cutscene here, and uh, I'm gonna follow around maybe... a yak and listen yeah. to this fucking girl talk about her problems, and then Atreus is gonna occasionally fight yeah. something. Yeah, I mean, the only thing story wise I liked in in Ragnarok was the the brock and Sindri stuff because it didn't overstay its welcome it was like quick i guess because they treated it like a side quest yeah but it was like quick hits it kept you engaged and it like made you appreciate those characters more and you can do that like you know that, that old shakespeare saying it's it's completely cliche but it's true brevity is the soul of wit yep and that's what a lot of these developers have forgotten and i think that's where they're hemorrhaging a lot of their money and creating these grand stories oh i want to work in hollywood but i can't Mm -hmm. and you look at all especially like these people out of ubisoft like the one the, the people keep saying there's two co-founders of sweet baby there's actually three and if you look at the one i forget what her name is but i i saw that prior to working at ubisoft she was selling fucking cell phones <laughs> how do you how the fuck like what dick were you sucking to get a, you know maybe she had a writing degree maybe i i, I you know maybe someone's like oh let's just take a chance on her yeah you know well it... but Go on, I'll let you finish your point, sorry. I was going to say, like, if you look at the timeline, I don't think that's when they were, like, going to be like, oh, yeah, 2013, yeah, we're, we're you know, she's been working at Verizon, yeah, we, you know, we need, we need to tick a box for a queer woman, you know? Yeah, but I also keep going back to the other point, too. It's, it's not only just that, but it's just so much talent is leaving the industry. They're just aging mm -hmm. out. Uh, there's also uh, uh, Chris, uh, Chris Avalon, I think, right? The famous writer they tried to meet to him uh yeah. remember that one and well the hauser brothers at rockstar i mean yeah uh, and just think about this too from every game to game that gets more successful mm -hmm. a lot of these devs leave and get better jobs at, because they can be the showrunners too of these giant games it's like you know for as much shit as we give like say someone like todd howard it's like it is something credible to still be at the front of a studio and be able to manage it. And uh, you look at like some of these other studios, like um, <clears throat> the Tim Schafer is still sticking around. Like, you know, even though like I disagree with a lot of his like social points of views, like the guy is a legend in gaming because he knows yeah. how to make a game like Psychonauts too. He knew how to make that game, you know? And these guys are in their fifties, you know, they're in yeah. their fifties. approaching. Well, me and Miyamoto as well. But I, I think Miyamoto, kind of has that chef approach mm -hmm. 
because like I heard a really good analogy the other day. Like you don't bring in outside talent when you're when you have a successful restaurant, mm-hmm. you bring in sous chefs and you train them to be the next head chef. Yeah. And I think Nintendo does that, you know, because you look at like Miyamoto's influence, he's not working. He he's there in a kind of a consultancy role. Yeah. Consultancy role, but like this talent that they have creating some of their games, like they're not him. No. And, and I don't even think he had all that much to do on Mario Wonder other than, you know, some Put input here it. and there. Yeah. yeah. And, and to also add like more to that too, like look at Capcom from back in the day with uh, Shinji mm-hmm. Mikami and yeah. uh, Hideki and all those people that worked on all these like masterpieces of games. They went off and made successful studios for the most part with like the Bayonetta, Evil Within. And these guys are still, like I said, they are up there, too. They're in their 60s, a lot of them, in Japan, too. And it's yeah. just, like, the, the reality of a situation is, it's like, the talent replacing the talent leaving is not up to par. Because, mm-hmm. like, for whatever reason, either just mediocrity or just unprofessionalism that got them the job, right. it's, it's producing terrible writing and... Well, I, th- I think part of that is is going back to that analogy. Like, you have to foster talent. Like, people mm-hmm. are saying, look, we need to bring in fresh, creative energy and talent. You do, but you don't put them in charge immediately. It's right. like, you know, when, when you're a kid and you're like, oh, man, I, I, I'm ready for this responsibility. I'm ready for this responsibility. And your parents telling you, no, you're not. There's good reason for that. And, you know, now I speak as a nearly 40-year-old man. It's like, um, sometimes I don't want the responsibilities that I have. But I, I will say that you know, because it took so long, I'm, I'm ready for them. I'm, I'm seasoned. And when you have people coming in, sometimes it pays off to have, you know, young, brash ideas. But when it comes to like smaller projects, mm-hmm. you know, maybe, maybe they can prove their, their, their metal in a smaller project and, and, and take that. Cause you know, again, like in the eighties, that's how it was like video games weren't a big thing. And you had like, like this young talent, but you know, granted, there was a lot of failure in, in that yes. time period that people like to gloss over and forget about that. There were more failures than successes. Mm-hmm. And, and go on, finish you know, your point. Sorry. I was going to say that the big studios made their, 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 their name in the world by, by, you know, having more calculated risks, I guess. <laughs> and just like to put that out there about people who earn their talent. Uh, I was watching an AVGN video mm-hmm. and he was playing a Terminator game. And he walks into the movie theater in the Terminator game, and you see plastered on there, front and center, Brian Fargo. And for those of you who don't know who Brian Fargo is, Fallout. Creator of Fallout, right there. Just yeah. boom. And I even I even like tagged him on Twitter. I was like, is this you? And he was like, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's like there these are like telling like uh speaking of like Fallout. The team that made Fallout, uh, uh, Urkis Farquhar and Brian Fargo, like the first one, those are now the two studio heads of In Exile and Obsidian Games, right there, respectively. Nice. You know? And uh, to also bring up some more points, Diablo's coming in here with uh, Brian uh, Mitsoda, that uh, uh, wrote the Vampire Bloodlines game, got fired from the sequel without a reason, and now they clearly rewrote this entire thing to be some power fantasy. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's it's unfortunate that that you know they're they're having these activists come in because these people are more concerned, you know. Again, like I, I've said I've said this on other shows, you always hear people talking about the importance of story mm-hmm. and message, and oh, we want we want to tell this from this perspective. Yes, you. It's such a contrast to like the early days of games. You know, like seeing these creatives interviewed or speaking about their games where they were talking about gameplay and mm-hmm. fun factor mm-hmm. and we want to make something that resonates with the audience yeah when well, you you know you always hear oh i want to see i want to see myself represented well you know i, I got into an argument of a, a friend of mine a black friend he was like i don't he was like who's your favorite spider-man and i said it's it's ben riley and he goes oh i would have thought that you would have been a uh, miguel o'hara fan since you guys have the same genetics and i'm like well that's kind of racist that is super racist (laughs) you know but his favorite spider-man is spider-punk and he knows absolutely nothing about spider-punk right other than that spider he found out spider-punk was black and he's like suddenly oh that's my and it's unfortunate some people have this reductionist brainwashing that they can only they only see race yeah like you know when i was growing up i loved bishop 
you know i i thought bishop had a really cool design mm -hmm. uh i like the idea that like oh crap you can't shoot this guy because if you shoot him the energy blast that becomes power for him that's pretty that's pretty awesome yeah you know uh, I mean, I love Wolverine, too, but as far as, like, uh, you know, but I, I didn't think, like, oh, wow, I like a black character. Like, yay me. I'm going to give myself a pat on the back. Right. You know, I, I loved, uh, you know, I, I wasn't a big basketball guy, but everybody back then loved Jordan and, and Shaq. Especially because I'm from being, Chicago. Yeah. He was like Jesus over here, you know. Yeah. I, I mean, I remember, like, I had, I had no idea who Steel was. And then when I saw, you know, it, it, Steel was a horrible movie, but... You know, like when they came, like anytime Shaq was in a movie, I wanted to see it, and you just didn't think about this stuff. I didn't, I didn't think like, oh man, I can't, I'd like to see that. This, this is a neat concept of Kazam, but you know, I, I'm this, I'm this mix, I'm this Hispanic white kid, and I, you know, I can't, I can't identify with that. No, you just didn't oh, think about no, this. No. Is some, such reductionist bullshit. It is. That's infested every facet of entertainment, and there's unfortunately people that have mentally bought into it. Well, have you seen uh, you've, you've you've seen that validate game, right? No, I haven't. So there, the the lady who was caught on there saying like, "Well, I don't have any white people on my team because you know." Oh yeah, 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 yeah. The the uh, Black Panther one, right? Yeah. So she made yeah, yeah, yeah. they made a game called Validate before, and uh, shout out to Fratega Plays who's been doing a playthrough of that one recently. And you look at like what they think is progressive, and it's like sometimes I just sit there and go like, "This is this seems like like." something the daily stormer would come up with about minority right. it is so racist and like just scary and it's like I'm like it's like okay the only thing that we can think about uh for this game that has predominantly black people is they work at a, a fried chicken restaurant uh, what, what are we doing here like this is Holy this is what shit. progressive is yeah I'm, I'm like looking at these designs and like that's it's wow it's, yeah it's like it's okay to stereotype if they do it and then it's, but it's like but it's like you say these are bad, but why? Why do you like also like make it sound like this is like you hired an actual real like racist? Like the, the, you got like the cartoonist for the Daily Stormer to come in and be like, "All right, give us a, a script idea, and then we'll just rework it." You know, it's like what, what are we doing here? It's just oh lord, I saw I see on here one friend already owns this game. It's James. Yeah, I think that's uh, where a lot of it comes from. I think it's that uh, I posted that meme where it's a line from this game where it's like. Uh, a light skin fa uh, failure or something <laughs> like it's just wow. like it's like some of the stuff here it's just like this is this is wild it's just like wild reading reading this description wow set in the jerky jerky city area the cast of lover lovers trudge through the dregs of capitalism a journey a transition a ra oh god yeah but you know something here i'm going to say this i don't care that game exists well nor do i yeah it, exactly it, it, yeah it's just you need winners, and, and this is a reason, like, to go back to Games Pass, this is why I, I hate the Games Pass is taking over, because in Games Pass, like, look at Starfield. Look at how Starfield has sold on PC. Look at how many people have stuck with it. Yeah. Well, they're like, there's 81, or how many how many people did they say were playing it? It was like, they said, like, there were, like, 23 million people have are playing Starfield. Yeah. But they're not looking at it as how many people are continuously playing it. Like, how many right. people just hey, there's the new big Bethesda game. It's coming out on Games Pass, and it's, you know, we're so starved for next-generation content. Um, I, I want to give this a look, which I, I personally did. I, I, I played through the first section of the game. I was like, this isn't for me, and I uninstalled it. Yeah. I, um, I, I actually like Starfield, so. <laughs> you know, know, and if, if you do, you do. I, I the, My reason for not liking it is mostly because I – they didn't do anything to really get me hooked from the beginning to like tell me like what you see in that no, vision. They, you like, are a hundred percent right about that. Every everyone who yeah. like has played the game and they said they stopped playing early. I fully admit that the beginning of this game was a slog. But yeah. and I like that, and it, it felt like Fallout without that. A little bit. I like the combat though. It felt like actually good for once, especially the later on. But. The thing is, it's just very simple. It's like, yeah. it's a new IP. I give it a little bit of a leeway here because, yeah. let's face it, it's easier to make Skyrim amazing when you make four other Elder Scrolls games yeah. and you have a much more established lore yeah. versus like what we saw with everything that happened with the fact the fact that Starfield exists to me is not it's more amazing not because it came out but because uh, Zenimax didn't fuck it up. 
you know? Like, they didn't find a way to destroy it. Because a lot of that stuff, too, is, like, I don't want to always say, like, everyone can... It's easy just to so, say, like, Tom Howard's the meme, you know? Everything sucks. Okay. And really, to me, it's like, well, the the board of ZeniMax uh, completely fucked them over after they made that big PR statement, like, we're here for player one. And then what happened was all their player one games didn't sell, and ZeniMax was like, we need yeah. money. We need money, baby. That's where we got such great gems as, like, Fallout 76's incredibly yeah. bad launch. Uh, Wolfenstein Youngblood, the game that fucking is terrible and no one remembers, except when you go, like, oh, yeah, that game does exist and it is bad. I wanted to like that so bad, too. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I really did. I, I I liked New Colossus for the most part. I didn't like the I didn't like the whole hey ev- between every mission you have to go dick around on the ship. Yeah, I felt like they cut that. Just every mission there was a cutscene. Fine, you know. Yeah, there's some messaging in there, but the over overall the the level design and the yeah. shooting is actually pretty tight. Um, but even still, the messaging is makes it makes more sense. You're like fighting. It the does, Nazis. right? It's like yeah, it's right, the right, right. it's the Nazis. Yes, they're the easiest people to to, to, to meme on yeah. because it's like their ideology is fucking garbage. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm talking about like the Deborah Wilson character more than anything. Yeah, I, I know, but it's like it makes you know it makes more it, sense in that sense. It, it was kind of funny though because she's like this this you know you know this big black power chicken she's she's like with this like the most beta male possible it's you know, most that was... beta male white boy <laughs> yeah there's an Artie lang sketch or there's an Artie lang bit that comes to mind he did it on on rogan it comes to mind with this his autistic or not autistic but his tourette syndrome bunk mate when he was in the halfway house yeah uh, but um you know with games pass like to go to go back to it it's like i i don't like the fact that it, it does you don't have winners and losers in the marketplace with games pass or streaming you know you get stuff like samba tv eventually the numbers will come out as far as who actually played it but yeah if they, if they want to make something that doesn't resonate with customers they, they can and will mm-hmm. you know they're not beholden to the bottom dollar and unfortunately people have been conditioned when it comes to any streaming service be it games or movies that I, and i've been in target several times where i've heard or target or walmart and i'll be in the electronic section and i still buy physical blu-rays i still buy 4k blu-rays yeah and um i'll hear dad mario movie oh it's free on netflix right now no it's not free on netflix and i i, I know somebody's like well that's some something that somebody's telling their kid yeah i've heard many adults say or actually my wife even said it she's like hey oppenheimer's free on peacock right now i'm like no it's not free you pay for it also right. i own the blu-ray yeah well, I get that, but it's like I always yeah. tell people all the time. It's like if these companies – like when people go like, oh, it's bad for the companies. I'm like if the company is making a bad deal to put their game on Game Pass, mm-hmm. you know, it's like then they just need to learn how to do better business. That's yeah. that's what I go well, I just I just worry it's going to become the norm, you know, and Sony has their own shitty version of Games Pass as well. Mm-hmm. You know, nobody talks about it because, again, Sony's terrible at marketing this stuff. And it's They're like, hey, <laughs> do you want to do you want to pay uh, sixty dollars a year for to the the right to play online with you know some some bonus games that you can you can play if you keep paying for the service, or do you want to pay one hundred and fifty for our our alternative to Games Pass? And it's terrible. And it, yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, uh, I do have to step away for one quick second. I'll be right back. That's fine. I'll just go read some mm-hmm. chats while you go away. Uh, coming over here. Uh, let's go over here. Uh, fun fact: Blade is half white. LOL. Mister Cage coming in strong there. Satello, I'm a Mexican and I've never played as one in games. <laughs> uh, Diablo coming in over here, talking with some good Starfield stuff. He's waiting for the modding tools, and on top of that too, he says. Bethesda games are incomplete unless you can turn your enemies into Thomas the Take Engine. There are some good mods out there, Diablo. And on top of that, too, um, I'm going to test this out later because I just reinstalled it on my PC. I guess the PC version of a uh, good old-fashioned uh, Starfield actually adds a lot of great stuff with this update. It's like a lot of people, anecdotally, have been saying they've reinstalled it and they're like, it's a much better game now than what is that launch. So that's something good to look into. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Game Pass is uh, very popular for people like me, too. I like to save my money. I like to keep my games kind of sealed. It is what it is with that. <laughs> Diablos are coming in. Indeed, Persona 3 Reloaded on Brazil is, like, super expensive. Nearly a third of the a month's salary. Holy shit. In Game Pass, I get the DLC for a fraction of the price. You get it for free, by the way. If you're a Game Pass Ultimate subscriber, uh, you get the Persona 3 DLC for free like you own it like you don't pay ex- like any extra 
money. You don't get it at a discount. It's not only tied to your Game Pass Ultimate subscription. You will actually own the DLC. So that's one of the nicer things for me, too, especially. Uh, I got the... Uh, I played Persona 3 on Game Pass. I played it on PC and the S just to kind of test it out. It's really good. I love it. But, uh, yeah, that's another good thing about it is that you don't yeah. have to pay... Well, if you're an Ultimate member, you got but the DLC for free. The, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. So while you can play it, you can't play it forever. And I will say... Well, well, I will of... say this. The DLC you do own with Ultimate. Like, they, hmm. the, the, like, if you have Ultimate, you get the DLC absolutely for free. It's not tied to you. Yeah, well, it's, part, it's part of the package. Like, yes. when, when they do, like, Injustice Complete or Mortal Kombat Complete. Yes, yes. You know, it's part of the package. Mortal Kombat 11 Ultimate. Um, you know, but the, you, you don't get to keep the games forever. But I, I will say, like, for the price, you know, because Games Pass, I, I see it hitting $20 this year, more than yes, likely. Yes, I, I could see that. I you don't know, disagree with you. I just say to people, just get a PC. Mm-hmm. Go go on Humble Bundle. You know, you can, you can go on Humble Bundle, and for eleven ninety nine a month, you get games that you're going to be able to keep forever in your Steam library. Or go to Fanatical. Fanatical has amazing bundles for games. And I see, you know, I have Games Pass. Um, I did the, the um, you know, we have multiple Xboxes in, in the house. We have right. multiple Switches, multiple mm-hmm. PlayStations. Um, you know, I have mine. My wife has hers. So, like, when we wanted the second Xbox, we did the Games Pass ultimate deal where yes. you basically you finance the console, but it's a 0% APR. Oh, that's cool. I, I, you're the first person I know that actually did that. Yeah, it's 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 a good it's a good way of doing it. And then mm-hmm. you're you're paying you're paying like um, thirty five a month for it, but you're you're basically paying fifteen dollars more, and then you have an Xbox Series that you get to keep forever. Yes, after it's done. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's a good deal. But if you have a PC, just buy these games on PC because you're you're going to find that if you buy one of these bundles. Typically, a lot of the games that are in Games Pass are included in these bundles, and mm-hmm. like I'll, I'll I'll look at some of the games I picked up in bundles, and I'll, I'll then I'll go and I'll look at what's on Games Pass, and I'm like, oh, I own that, I own that, I own that, I own that. Um, you know, I I I think that you're better off in the PC space, to be honest. Like, I understand a lot of people think that you know PC is a big barrier, but you know you can get a refurb steam deck for 230 get a dock mm-hmm. off of amazon and and you're good to go I and mean, you're gonna be mm-hmm. able to play the bulk of what's on pc uh or uh you just build a small pc like typically there you know even those i buy power pcs they sell at walmart with yeah. a you know a, a you know a 3060 in there you know for 500 bucks that that'll get you where you need to go ant online's a good resource so for people to say like yeah pc is way too expensive you, you don't need a 4080 or 4090 to, to play, the, you know, really good games. Um, and, and how many people actually have good 4K TVs out there? I mean, most of the people I know, uh, it's, it amazes me. Like, yeah, I got a 65-inch TV. It's 1080p. I'm like, okay, well, you know, why are you obsessed with 4K graphics? Yeah. I mean, the whole thing for me is like, it's like it's a catch-22 for me. Because mm-hmm. I don't try to look at gamers like myself. I will try to get people to be aware of stuff that's kind of like my big thing but you never know what a person's budget is and the one thing about pc gaming or if they fall into an ecosystem yes that's a big one but like also that's that's where please don't judge me please don't (laughs) judge me but i've I've bought into this ecosystem it's fine but like uh but like i'm saying too is like one of the big problem with pc gamers is like it's not so much like the games it's maintaining the pc your optimization and all that stuff a lot of people do not know how to optimize their pc they don't know how to optimize their games well i i will say that they've made it easier like you know i i i i have i don't always have the nicest things to say about nvidia but nvidia mm-hmm. has done a really good job with uh the current geforce experience for automatically optimizing games for oh, for the customers yeah no you're right about that because i'm a i'm a fucking luddite all right i don't know how to fucking work this computer stuff that well i've learned from fernando but my wife's brother my brother-in-law he is a computer science major too you know so he uh got all my parts i just said like here here's here's my phone it's black friday put the cards just, parts in like you want to build it. it yeah all right i told him this is the only thing i bought a 3070 ti 
go build around that. You know, that's what I did. Mm-hmm. Cause I, I'm like, if I'm going to build this PC, I'm going to future proof it as much as I can, because mm-hmm. you, you see some of these cards right now, they're still around. It's just like, Oh God, yeah. man, please, for the love of God, put it out to pasture. But, and when you bought that 3070 TI, it was probably around the time that the people were, were scooping them up for crypto. Yeah. So yeah. Probably but, uh, inflated. Well, I got mine brand new. I, I got in the Best Buy line and I bought it. Okay. And then I just, I just, did a, a pay in four kind of deal for that one. Yeah, yeah. And then I just waited until Black Friday, and then I went to my brother in law and just been like, "Okay, here, go." <laughs> you know, it's like you're you're the whiz yeah. kid. I said, "Build it like you would build your dream PC." No. You know, and I mean, I, I did get to build my dream PC this past year, and it was it was fun to go through. But I I, I do understand the the hesitation, and, and you know, there there is that stigma around a lot of pre builds. Yeah. But that that being said, I think pre builds have gotten better. I think that like, because I I I used to be a PC gamer, and then I started working in IT. And when you work in IT and you're on a computer all day, the last thing you want to do is sit behind a, a computer. And I still work in IT, but I'm not I'm not hands on and I'm not customer focused anymore, and right. I'm not racking servers anymore. Right. Um. So now it's like you know, Christmas rolled around. I got a Christmas bonus. They basically gave me um a grand to to pick something up so i started oh, nice. off with with a pre-built and then i ended up replacing a lot of components <laughs> i replaced basically everything and then my birthday rolled around and my wife's like what do you want and i was like i want a fractal torrent case and she's like i don't know what that is but tell me where we can get it and uh it's it's sitting right here this this massive very nice massive rig yeah um with the tempered glass sides and I, I was never an RGB guy, but I, 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 I called this my kryptonite build because everything in there is green. <laughs> um, it's, it's daunting for sure. But I will say going back to steam, there is no comparison with how fast a game will install on steam, like download and install versus console. Mm-hmm. Like it is, it is night and day. Yeah. I, I, I mean, even on a shit connection, I can have a game like a, a 50 or 60 gigabyte game downloaded and installed on steam in five minutes whereas on playstation or xbox it it, it takes upwards of an hour 15 to 20 sometimes yeah yeah 15 to 20 sometimes but for the most part like you know like uh i I did pick up dragon's dogma on ps5 god bless you thank you (laughs) i i just was like after after princess after uh princess peach showtime wasn't doing it for me i was like okay oh you didn't you didn't you weren't a fan of it um i'm not giving up on it but it's very handholdy, and it's 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 a game that I think is is designed. It's it's a weird game because it feels like it's designed for a younger audience, but the challenge is like small moment windows of opportunity. Mm. I'm not giving up on it, but it you know the first the first four acts are like getting you used to the different costumes she can wear, and they're gotcha. all very varied. Um. Like the first one is Sword Fighter Peach, and that's fun. Mm. Uh, but the game is two buttons. It's two buttons and the well, three buttons technically. You have the uh, triggers to do a pose that unlocks certain. You know, it's it's, it's a, a context sensitive thing. Mm. You have a jump button and you have an attack button. All right. And you have to do a lot of parries, but you parry with the jump button. Interesting. But you can also you can parry after getting hit, which kind of feels broken. Mm. And certain enemies you can only kill by parrying them, so they'll hit you. You hit the jump button after you've been hit, and then you'll go into the parry animation. It feels like it's it was like it feels very like um, overly easy. Like there, there there could have been a better challenge there. And then the game likes to show you a lot of things, so you be in a level and they'll do like a little cutscene, and it stops the gameplay. And if you have to replay the level because you missed one collectible, it can get a bit frustrating. <laughs> So it didn't it didn't really win me over, and then I, I watched the Game Ranks episode, and I ended up getting Dragon's Dog again. I have a forty eighty, I have sixty four gigs of RAM, I've got six gigs of NVMe storage with you know two Samsung nine eighty Pros. Yeah, I mean this thing's a beast, but I was just like I'm just gonna get on a PS five for now just for the performance. Yeah, so, sometimes because... it's just also nice to just sit back on a couch too, you know. That that too. That yeah. too. Like I, I don't. I, I'm. I'm not like a, a purist. Like I'm. I'm just like yeah. Okay, I'll. I'll get it on PS5 because I'd prefer to play it there. And yeah. No, know. I. I totally get that. And that's kind of like the one thing I do like about Game Pass and having all this ecosystem built in, is I can go from my PC and then I can go into my bedroom and with the cross save I can just sit down and just, 
kind of chill because I don't like sitting at my computer desk all day. You know, it hurts my back, and I'm already doing that at work a lot too. You know, and but like, yeah, it's just play where you where you can play how you want to play. I just want people to play the games I like. You know, and, and I I do understand that there there are the Games Pass can be attracted to people who have already bought into the Xbox ecosystem. Uh, I, I mean, I'm I'm a little bit of a special case because I've technically bought into five ecosystems. More yeah. actually, if you count like Nintendo's defunct ecosystems like uh, 3DS and Wii. And oh yeah, Wii trust U. me, I'm I'm with you there, yeah. buddy. I got P- PlayStation 2, yeah. GameCube, Dreamcast, I, a Sega Saturn yeah. that no one even bought. Well, that I'm, I'm just talking. I'm talking digital ecosystems. Like I've bought into the PlayStation digital ecosystem, and oh, thankfully. Yeah. Well, actually, technically, they bifurcated it with three and four, but I still have my PlayStation Three over here. Yeah, because they did um, a terrible job trying to get backwards compatibility. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so technically more digital, but I'm I'm invested in the PlayStation digital ecosystem, the Xbox digital ecosystem, Switch, Steam, mm-hmm. and and Oculus. Uh, probably also GOG too, and some Epic games yeah, too. Yeah, you know? most of the stuff I have on GOG, most stuff I get super cheap. Yeah, I, exactly. I I've actually I've actually staunchly been against Epic. Because <laughs> the ten cent involvement, I, I hear that the launcher is actually a good launcher. Um, uh, a launcher is a launcher to me. Does the game work? But, All right, we're good. Yeah, <laughs> but I've still got stuff on BattleNet and Origin. I wish they would just say like, "Hey, if you have anything on BattleNet, you can download it on Steam." So I can, you know, get all yeah. my Diablo stuff over on Steam. But yeah, like or cross saves or something like you know, yeah, something, something. just something. But at least you know, yeah, if you own it there. At Origin, I have a few of the Battlefield games over there, and yeah. uh, I have effect three over there now i have mass effect legendary on steam so it's whatever yeah uh c- catching up a little bit on some super chats there uh in game pass it, uh i get the dlc for a fraction of the price although to be honest i played the answer for the original persona 3 and honestly i feel ex- <laughs> free is expensive so the diablo saying he was not a fan of like what they did originally uh mr cage says i lost all my save data on my ps5 so sony sucks ass and then mm. Satello's making fun of me. Quote, I like to save money. Meanwhile, has four copies of Unicorn Overlord. <laughs> you know, you ain't wrong. You ain't wrong. <laughs> what's, what's the game you think you've dipped on the most? Oh, hell, man. Uh, oh, that's a that's a good question. I don't know. I, I kind of just, like, think Skyrim has been, like, the game that's followed me around everywhere that it could. Uh, I just don't have it on Switch yet. Um... Yeah, that that's that's an anomaly because like, that thing came out in 2017. It's still full f- full price most places. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Um, I think I, it's just like I don't know. I'm also kind of the guy who will, if I if there's a multiplayer game, like I will still go out and buy the physical disc. Yeah. So I will buy like the multiplayer game and have it in there. And then when it goes down to like super cheap, I'll rebuy it for like 20 bucks. So that way I don't have to worry about the disc anymore. And I could still keep playing my other games and just like, well, if somebody's like, oh, we want to play Monster Hunter. I'm like, all right, one second. You know, instead of getting up and going to get the disc, I'm like, all right, I'll be there. And like, instead of uh, wasting two minutes, I'll just do like five seconds. <laughs> and then uh, Chris coming through over here. I've run into Game Pass disease where I barely fucking beat anything while subscribed. I'm with Extra Zero. I'm building my Steam library and playing through that. But I'm also a ADHD ridden fuck. So that there's that too. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it, that's that's one thing, too. And you have – it's like back in the day, I think people watched more TV when they had less options. Yes. You know, and, and now it's just like, you know, we have all these, these – it, it's weird because it's like it's it's simultaneous that there's never been a better time and have never been a worse time to be a gamer. Yeah, I mean, especially, too, it's like uh, some, some people like – there was a question uh, some random guy on Twitter posed. He's like, uh, people who have, like, everything, you know, like – how do you decide what you're going to play? And I just basically tell them, it's like, look, I will go through, I'll start up random games, and I just basically try to find something to stick, you know? Dude, and the, the other irony is if you can afford to buy the games you want to play, chances are you don't have the time to play. Uh, that's another problem, too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just eight hours a day going to work. If you got family, you got to take care of your kids, you got Dude, dogs. I, I, eight, eight hours is if I'm lucky. Yeah. And especially now that they've made us return to the office, it's got there's a commute involved now too. So yeah. it's like, and yeah. then you know I, I lost seventy pounds over you know going from twenty twenty three to twenty twenty four. Oh damn, and, dude! Uh, Congratulations, yeah, that's a big you. accomplishment, man. Yeah, I did the carnivore diet and I got my ass back in the gym every day. So it's like I go to work. I'm you know typically working you know ten hour day. Um, mm-hmm. You know I do 
it takes me like you know 45 minutes each way unless uh 95's really effed up and then you know i gotta get get myself to the gym i'm there for like 90 minutes to two hours and then you know taking care of the, the dog spending some time with my wife and then it's like okay i got 90 minutes to play a game yeah uh, like my job is like a 45 minute car drive without mm -hmm. traffic you know, so I, yeah. I I get in there, I start work at eight thirty, I leave at five fifteen is when I clock out, out the door at like five thirty, get home at close to six. You know, it it's yeah. it's a large portion of your day gone. Yeah, and I, I think that's what's made like the the stuff like Hell Divers that's like very gameplay centric mm -hmm. stick out for me because it's like I I don't I when when I want to unwind I want to play a game I don't want to be uh, saddlebagged by the story or yes you know being introduced hey here's a tutorial section play through all these mechanics like games back in the day didn't have tutorials it was like boom they've thrown you in the middle of it mm -hmm. uh, i'd love to see you know they used to have those fine brothers reacts videos yeah. i'd love to do one of my own i'd love to be like hey do you like resident evil oh i love resident evil and then just give some poor kid resident evil 2 that assumes that you played the first game yeah and like literally starts you off raccoon city on fire with like uh 16 bullets and uh dozens upon dozens of zombies mm -mm 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 -mm. you know yeah and I, and tank controls no oh explanation God. of the tank controls yeah no, yeah you're just really punishing them at that point yeah but like that's kind of like why i really like uh unicorn overlord because it's a game where i can i can play an hour of it and put it down mm -hmm. and i can just like okay i feel good or like e even though like a lot of people didn't like diablo 4 i'm like that's one of the big selling points for yeah, me for pick diablo up and 4. Play. i can pick up and play i can play with my three other buddies you know we can just like fuck up lilith and then we could just call it a day you know for it, what it's worth, Diablo 4 didn't put the story in front of the gameplay. The no. story is there, and the cutscenes are there, but it, it's it's it does not get in the way of, like, look, I want to play a game. It's like, no, 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 you got to wait 45 minutes. Diablo's like, okay, hey, we'll give you a, a two-minute cutscene, and then we'll give you, like, minute-long dialogue boxes. Yep. But it doesn't get in the way of you actually playing and enjoying the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody said this to me before, and I... I kind of do agree with it it's a lot of games don't make cutscenes feel like a reward anymore right yeah absolutely that's a great point it, it's like you know it's like the gameplay now feels like the reward yes that's the funny part you know, about for, it. for sitting through their cutscene it's like you, know, you guys got this in reverse what happened yeah and that's that's the one thing about like blizzard for all the bad shit they do their cinematics are always feel like a treat or a reward mm -hmm. like it's not like when i'm playing final fantasy 16 which literally just feels like a movie and then i press x a few times and then it's back to the movie where i fell yeah. asleep playing it that's how pissed off i got with this game it's just like yeah. what it is but i'll say uh namco gets it here and there like i enjoyed tekken 8 and i actually loved going through and getting those endings because they're just as crazy and zany as ever and mm -hmm. you know going through and playing as a character to see like yeah what kind of insane ending am i going to get with brian how about uh paul how about you know panda that that just yeah that stuff put a smile on my face exactly like that and this uh that's something that we're not seeing from some game companies anymore where it's just like they really want to show off that they have a mocap studio they really mm -hmm. want to show off that they got a big budget but at the end of the day it's like when we were talking about sega earlier too it's like mm -hmm. there is something to be said it's like just give the players what they want right and just don't make crazy budgets like i'm going to be honest with you i don't think persona 3 cost as much money to make as spider-man 2 okay right and i think honestly well, how, how about the the yakuza games and and the yes the, the like a dragon series it's like they know what they're doing you know and they're, they're you know i i disagreed with the you know paywalling new game plus but oh without a doubt that's gummy yeah they're, they're definitely getting these games out and they're they're doing them on a on a, a moderate budget and they're 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 making something that people want to play mm-hmm and it feels like what they're doing is they're doing something right where mm -hmm. they are kind of keeping like the game like there it's already been pre-built they just keep adding little bits of details to it minor graphical improvements here and there mm -hmm. combat improvements and just really focusing on like making those stories and those worlds mm -hmm. well lived in and and also making love letters to sega too because they they always are putting like i think the last one had some games that were never released in home consoles in yes. the arcade yeah, they do. They have been putting a lot of those still on there as well. And 
the Yakuza games are also a perfect example of a game that balances that line of very fucking serious and very fucking silly. Goofy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like one minute yeah. I'm I'm just I'm brawling with like the head of this Yakuza clan and I'm he cut me up and then the next minute I'm getting suckered into uh, a baby fetish club. <laughs> you know, it's just like and I mean that right. like they want to dress up like babies. It's not like they want to fuck babies. Let's be honest. Right, right, right. Let's be clear here. I know some people. We're, we're talking know. men, men in diapers. Yes, is what we're talking. like they want like a woman to change their diaper and they want to drink from a bottle and act like babies because they are fucking degenerates. <laughs> you know, and it's stuff like that where it's like there is still like that fun factor that's still like out there to you know go play and stuff like and, that. And- And that's the thing that I think has always made video games an interesting genre of entertainment because, you know, if you were to go back and explain, you know, the most popular video games, um, like explain Super Mario Brothers, oh, I'm a plumber in a fantasy land where you go and stomp on turtles and you can get flowers and stars to give you powers. And people go, what the fuck are you talking about? You know, but you're here to rescue the princess from this dragon. Yes. Which is a very classical medieval concept. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, or Legend of Zelda, you know, um, you know, just explaining that can be abstract or Metroid or, you know, even Sonic. That Oh, you're a, you're a, a, a hedgehog that can run super fast. Wait a minute. Isn't that a isn't that an oxymoron? Not here. And you're uh, rescuing all your animal pals because they've been turned into cyborgs by this fat uh, Teddy Roosevelt looking fucker. Yeah. <laughs> And you're fighting an echidna that can fly in the air, and everyone's like, "What the fuck's an echidna?" <laughs> you know, it's just... right? You know, it's just it's the abstract and the absurd uh, melded with with a, a little bit of seriousness that creates this special kind of brevity. You know, to tie it all back into things that are funny or unintentionally funny. It's just it's it's like the absurdity is is what made gaming feel special. Mm-hmm. You know. I mean, like Mister Mosquito is like one of those games. Yes, that you will never see really ever again. But ever, but if you're around from that time, you well, you know. I, I I wouldn't say we'd never see it again because you know again in the PC landscape, you know unless something drastically changes, and I I hope it doesn't. Uh, you know you you'll see somebody go. You know what? I really miss that game, Mister Mosquito, and 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 they they'll probably create Mosquito Simulator. Because that's basically, if Mr. Yeah. Mosquito came out today, that's what it would be labeled as. And you know, that's a good point. I mean, do we, we have a chance to see love letters, you know? Yeah. Like, that that's the thing. We see a lot of love le- love letters, excuse me, from the indie space. Like, you know, Sea of Stars, that's a love letter. It feels like to some of those old classic RPGs of the, you know, Super NES era. And believe it or not, there is a, a, a love letter to that game that's planned to come out. It's called The Mosquito Gang. <laughs> it's coming out quarter three, 2023. Oh, so it's already out. Oh, I'm sorry, tw- 2024. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but they're calling it a simulation game, uh, and uh, it's also apparently co-op. Oh, that's interesting, With on- online PvP. Yeah. So... Yeah, and it's just like I, I love I love that space. You know, I, I, I that's the thing that's that's you know I've been enjoying the most about about PC gaming is just as I mentioned the the experimental stuff, and I feel like that's been lacking in gaming, and and that was like what made the PS2 era and really the Dreamcast a breath of fresh air. Cause you remember the the one game, uh, Seaman. Uh, well, Seaman, <laughs> sure, but um, it was uh, you played as like toys. Ah. Uh... Toy Commander. That's I. I was like, I, I know yeah. what you're talking about. I've never played it, but yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, and that and that game was was really cool because you could play as like planes and boats, and you were just like basically fighting in in different parts of a house. Mm-hmm. And it's just like you know where where is that experimental stuff? Like everything now, it just feels like it's got to be like a third person or or first person shooter or a walking simulator. You know, you know where that that stuff is in the indie space. It's in the indie space, it's and in indie a lot space. of it's on PC. And and, and you know, and, and then you know, occasionally we do get mixed genre games. Like I, I loved uh, Near Automata, and, yeah. and that, that that's a, a you know a, a rare treat. But people forget that used to kind of be the norm. Like oh, in this level you do this, in this level you do that, and and you know, games were more more or less like vignettes. Like they were almost like Tarantino movies in structure. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I just want Parappa to wrap a comeback. Come on, we just need, we gotta believe. Again. We gotta believe. We gotta do what? Gotta believe. 
Granted, granted. Now I'd, I'd hate to see how they fuck up Parappa because I could see the story getting in the way. Well, you know what they probably do? They just uh, replace Parappa to Rappa and just be like Oom Lammy Jammy Part Two, which I would be okay with. I'd be okay with that too. Yeah. yeah. It's like, but you know, it, we just we just need some of those like fun games again. That just right and and smaller budget games. I mean, mm-hmm. gaming's gotten expensive. You'd think, you'd think that in this economy, you know. Instead of saying like, oh yeah, we got to nickel and dime people with, and, and maybe they'll get it. Like Hell Divers, Hell Divers, I think is a great example of launching a forty dollar game in 2024 mm-hmm. that's massively popular. Um, you know, it's gameplay first. It's mm-hmm. a multiplayer only game. You know, that's the way to do it right. And I really hope Sony sees what was successful about that game instead of going we need to make a hell divers 3 and it's got to be story based and yeah. you know we need to find out who the hell divers are and why they fight for democracy and yeah. no that's not what we want we want to escape the real world and uh we want to have fun and we want to have levity and we want to live in a universe that isn't ours because sometimes there's stuff in the world that's shitty or yeah. sometimes we just want to have fun and have a break from it all well we just want to make memes it's like yeah i want to play right. i want to play hell divers and like yeah i get the overall story that it's like a parody of starship trooper kind of deal i'm like but i don't think i'm going to go outside and commit uh, hate crimes after playing hell divers with right. my friends no i'm going to go play hell divers i'm going to say some stupid stuff because it's outrageous and funny and then i'm going to go back to work and i'm just going to and, like just pull pull boxes because that's what i do right it's like yeah. it's it's I just mean, we're having fun it's like yeah, uh, my, my first on. meme was a video game meme now that i think about it and yeah. you know it's just i want to be inspired by, yes. by games i don't want to i don't want it to be a reflection of the uninspired real world where mm-hmm. you know and just to also point out another thing too is like look at the the two like most popular games that came out just this year were for in terms of just like concurrent player accounts have been just like pal world mm-hmm. a, a game that just like is an early access like survival sim for the most part with pokemon like elements right and another thing too is hell divers which is just like that good old-fashioned left for dead kind of feel you know just chaotic fun you know and it's just about having fun with your friends it's not it's literally not a single player great story cinematic moment game no it's like the games that always seem to do well are like lethal company uh hell divers pal world you know like look like just these games are just like they have multiplayer elements they have single player elements they just have an element that you can do they're not there's no real story in there you know yeah i mean if you go and look at the the top sellers on steam right now it's you get hell divers 2 dragon dog dragon's dog with 2 but you get you get right below it counter strike even that's free Mm-hmm. Uh oh God, uh the number five, the number five is actually the Steam Deck, which is, <laughs> is, is kind of funny. But you get the Horizon Forbidden West Complete Edition for sixty bucks. God help those people paying that. God help those Rain- people. Yes. Yeah. Rainbow Six Siege is, is probably the only thing Ubisoft has left making money. That's number six. <laughs> uh Baldur's Gate Three. That's rightfully there. Yes, and uh, it's also multiplayer. Uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake Integrate is is on there, but I think a lot of people are probably like, yeah, well, I'll play this. So by the time yeah. uh, Rebirth gets ported over, I'll be ready. Exactly. Apex, Elden Ring, but you don't have any like recent releases outside of Dragon's Dogma 2, and uh, I, I guess Horizon technically is a recent one. Yeah. But, I, I, I was so disappointed with that one. Yeah. But Rainbow... <laughs> siege and and uh baldur's gate now baldur's gate came out in august of last year uh rainbow six siege came out december 1st 2015 yeah then you get below that elden ring that's been out since 2022 stardew valley war thunder dead by daylight warframe the the only really new game you you get on there and i mean new in the sense that it was a, a recent release outside of dragon's dogma and helldivers is modern warfare 3 that game, I don't know why that's on there. Yeah. All right. Well, we are at the roughly three-hour time limit. Um, I think we became best friends after this. I can honestly say that. <laughs> Great. I, I'd love to. I'd love to to chat on here again, man. That'd be awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's like I said. Oh, uh, I know you from just like our little thing here. I didn't realize that we were just gonna just hit it off so well. <laughs> you know, like honestly, it's it's nice to just sit down with somebody and just like have people that kind of get my references sometimes and I get their references. Yeah. So, uh, 
really do appreciate you coming on. Um, this was yeah, yeah. appreciate the opportunity. I thought it was going to be fun, but this was more enjoyable than I thought it was going to be. That's for awesome. damn sure. And uh, can't wait to do something more. We got to play a game or something together. Even, yeah, I you know definitely got to get on Hell Divers. Yes, I I, oh. I got to play some more Hell Divers. It's just unicorn overlord has been taking my soul and yeah. trying to do all this other stuff today you know uh but yeah do you want to just shout out again like uh your socials everything else yeah uh, absolutely so, yeah i've got my i've got my link tree out there and in there you'll see links to my twitter at extra zero oh eight if you like memes if you like hot takes on video games or I, I post a lot of fun stuff i just did a poll on there like what's better gummy bears or gummy worms and people are like how can you make me choose i'm like no i, I really want to know because it's a tough question uh, so give me a follow over there. I, I just passed, uh, I, I, I passed, I think 600 subscribers or not subscribers, but followers over there not too long ago. Yeah. I'd like to get to a thousand by the, the summertime. That would be awesome. Yeah. Uh, nice, nice. Yeah. Also give me a follow over on the, the Legion of memers. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. Give the Legion a follow. We post a lot of memes. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different, you know, lot, a huge variety of memes. I tend to post memes that you know, stuff that comes to mind and uh, things I just generally find funny. Um, you know, uh, we do a Saturday show with a lot of different guests. I uh, actually just rebooked James and Kay for April 13th. Oh, nice. Um, and we, we have a lot of fun on that show. We try to be an antidote to the culture war. We don't try to doom and gloom or anything on there. We just try to have actually reasonable conversations about, mm -hmm. you know, what's going on, a lot of different takes, and not all of us are in agreement. So it's we always have some good conversations over there. We go live every Saturday at 4 p.m. Uh, we got a, a good guest booked for next Saturday. Uh, if you've watched Gronkin' on Dogs, it's the one and only Cream Nato. Love that dude. He's hilarious. That's a great name. So, uh, you know, check us out over there so we have a lot of fun. Uh, and then also, as I mentioned earlier, I do a show every Thursday night at 9 o'clock Eastern with uh, some friends of mine uh, from the Internet, from the collecting community. It's called Figure Action. And we talk primarily about Transformers, uh, but we also talk about every every other action figure line out there, anything that's interesting to us. There's some video game-related stuff on there. In fact, uh, speaking of Sega, uh, Jax Pacific is doing Sega figures. They, they're doing Altered Beast, Streets of Rage. Uh, we, we talked about the uh, the Axel figure that they have coming out. Uh, and we also talk about higher-end. We talk mostly about higher-end stuff, but anything of interest coming to retail talk about it. it's a two hour long show give us a subscribe uh, a subscription and uh, check out the giveaway video for the omega prime if you like robots if you like optimus prime if you're a fan of transformers uh 2000 2001's robot uh, yeah, the 2001 transformer series <laughs> robots in disguise we're giving away that omega prime it won't come out until 2025 but hey uh we'd appreciate a subscription and uh and uh you know uh, you're very welcome to enter if you're in the continental U.S. That's going to be an awesome piece to get. And, uh, yeah, we're on our, our way to getting monetized over there after five years. It's been a long journey. So there, nice. Would, would that's really good to hear, man. It's always good yeah. to see somebody grinding and not giving up, you know. It, it It is very good to see that. And you also made a new fan over here. Chris is like, this guy was fucking awesome. You know? Awesome. Hey, I appreciate that. So. Yeah. yeah, and then of course I'm I'm over on the Melee Games Discord a lot. So great people in that in that chat and that community. Mm -hmm. So if you're a part of that, head on over there because uh, we we have a lot of fun. Kay is my sister. We've already confirmed this. <laughs> it's, it's the running joke there. We are. It's so funny too because it's like we have a lot of say, the same interests. And then we we also found out uh, recently like my birthday is May twenty second, her birthday is May twenty fifth. Oh, so okay. we've been we've been just like just joking about it. It's like oh yeah, we are the Gemini's, you know, we we are the yeah. twins, you know. <laughs> I, I mean, I've I've got a lot in common with James. I mean, we're both Aquariuses. We're both left handed. We we like most of the same things. Except um, I found out that uh, he doesn't like a one steak sauce oh. earlier today, and that oh, broke wow. my heart. <laughs> I mean, I mean, sure. I, I I also don't like having stuff in my ass, but. <laughs> You gotta have a couple differences. This guy. And speaking of steaks, too, we go, God damn it, we're gonna be here for a while. But I gotta say, if you like this guy, follow him. Oh yeah, I do. I do post my cooking. He does post a, like some of the most yeah. tasty looking meat. I am very jealous that yeah. he's got a good smoker, and I don't. <laughs> oh, I'm actually trying to become a, a a legitimate pit master. That's like a goal of mine for mm -hmm. the summer. So uh, my uh, my cousin's stepdad is a, is a a legit pit master. Oh and, wow. Uh, I'll be staying with him uh, when we do our family vacation in August. Uh, they're they're staying with us this year, so I'm gonna finally lock down like how do I make all that happen? Because yeah. um, 
you know, my, my, the pulled pork that I make, everybody, you know, everybody I've given it to is like, this is the best pulled pork I've ever had. Oh, so, yeah. I, I, then, I know. hate pork, but I love making pulled pork because it is the best. Yeah. And it, 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 like mine, it, it, it's, 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 it like melts in your mouth. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that's all I can say. I do cherry, hickory, mesquite. Mm. And, um, I'm, I'm working on making my own barbecue sauce. Ooh, there you um, go. I've been doctoring up barbecue so i'm, I'm going to make some from scratch because i feel like if you're going to be a pit master not only do you have to make your own rub you have to make your own sauce so yes um, that's yes. that's uh one one thing i'm going to be changing about it but i keep the sauce very similar to to what i've been what i've been using yeah so. i i know that this summer i'm actually trying to make some good old-fashioned barbacoa and oh that's, nice that's... All right, so are you, are you actually going to do a cow head i'm not going to do a cow head but i'm going to do a uh, tongue tongue okay yeah so, so you're going to get banana leaves yeah, uh, I'm gonna try. I uh, see. I okay. live in a townhome, so I gotta kind of do it like a little different. I've been trying to convince yeah, yeah. my uh, father-in-law to let me dig a pit in his backyard, and he's like fighting me tooth and nail on it. And I'm like, you know, it's going to happen one day, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's like because my mother-in-law, she kind of like loves when I cook for them. Yeah, so, so it's like, hey, you know. Yeah, so like, we're trying. Like I'm, I uh, so over by me in Costco because I have such a giant uh asian uh population with uh, some muslims by it they have uh giant full lambs like full goats you can buy there for like yeah. three dollars a pound and i've been trying to give like because that's what i want to do is like get a real barbacoa get the lamb nice. throw it in the ground cook it in the ground and then just do that but he's been fighting me on that one <laughs> so but it's like i live in a town home i don't have a i can't do this i'll get in trouble if i try to do it this way Right, basically, if you have your neighbor like looking out, like what you're doing, or if they're like, "Is that a body?" Well, you know, like I like uh, my my neighbors are pretty cool. Like one guy's like yeah. a, a a cop who's a giant Trump lover. The other guy, the other one's like a family of Puerto Ricans. There's like an old guy across the street, and then there's like a few like uh, you know like a liberal couple down there. We call them the the gay buffalo couple because they have a giant rainbow buffalo on their car, and we don't know why. It's just like ah, they're, they're just the gay buffaloes, you know. But, like, everyone around here is kind of cool on this side. It's on the other side where I got, like, this weird neighbor who always is looking out, and he never says anything. I wave at him, and they never talk. So they they, they would report me. They've reported me many times. <laughs> but, yeah, my, my old townhome community was, like, we had some cool people, but, yeah, we also had some, uh, you know. Yeah. But, some, some, yeah. yeah I, I, I get it. Yeah, I understand. It's, it's, it's one of the... The plus side about a townhome over here, I don't have to shovel. The negative side, I have to still shovel shit from other people. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, man, for, for real, like I said, I love these type of, like, just doing this whole series that I've been working on. And I I always tell people I'm, I'm not an interesting person, but everyone that I bring on is always so interesting, unique. I mean, just, like, listen to what you said here, you know. You went from, like, making memes, like, on basically a potato and just printing them out with floppy disks. And yeah. Then, and then, like, you know all this stuff about Transformers. You know all this stuff about games, comedy. And, like, you you, you know how to, like, smoke and grill and cook, like, stuff like yeah. that. Like, these these things are unique. And I like to I, I used like to this. I used to think that I wasn't an interesting person. And <laughs> that's the that's the, the, the funny thing is, like, I, I grew up around sports celebrities. I mean... I don't want to. I don't want to give out where where I, I you know, came from. But uh, the bowling alley that my grandmother managed, it was owned by a former Baltimore Colts player, Alex Sandusky. Oh wow! And uh, yeah, we used to have a lot of former uh, Colts players and and Orioles uh, players come into the bowling alley. So I, I knew a lot of these a lot of these guys. Like, you know, I grew up. You, you know, obviously, you probably know Johnny Unitas, right? Of course. Yeah, I'm a big sports um, fan. Are you a big sports fan too? Not, I, I'm a baseball fan, not really a football fan. Because like when I was growing up, like you know the the Ravens, the Ravens weren't a thing yet. The yeah, Ravens it was still the Colts. Colts. Yeah, and then yeah, uh, the, Colts. the Mayflower trucks pulled up, and then everyone got yeah. mad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, and it was funny because people that were Colts fans hated the Steelers and they hated the uh, the the Redskins. So like even though they didn't have a football, there, there were some that were like, okay, well Colts are gone now. We're Redskins fans. Um, and there were some that were like Colts are gone now we're Steelers fans depending on where they lived, um, mm-hmm. and then there were some people that are like now nah, we 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 are just Colts fans and and unless Baltimore has a team we're we're not in it. Yeah. Uh, that's that was the camp that my family found themselves in until the Ravens showed up. But um, 
I grew up around Art Donovan and Johnny Unitas. They were just Mr. Art, Mr. Don- John. They were friends of my grandmother's. That's and, insane. Um, See, that's I remember. So interesting. Yeah, I, I didn't think anything of it until there was an episode of Pete and Pete uh, that was about Johnny Unitas. And I was like, I remember saying to my grandmother, I was like, my mom, Mr. Art is on Nickelodeon. Yeah. And she was like, what? And I was like, yeah, Mr. Art, he's on Nickelodeon. She's like, for what? I was like, he's on Pete and Pete. She's like, what's Pete and Pete? <laughs> I was like, it's a show. And, 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 you know, the whole episode was, you know, about some 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 mystery that was solved by, by you know, Johnny Unitas and the greatest game ever played. It was, I, I can't remember. It was abstract and it was years ago. But, yeah. uh, you know, it's just funny to, to, you know, I tell people like, yeah, I, I grew up knowing those guys. And I knew uh, Rick Dempsey. I never knew uh, Ripken. Like Ripken um, was didn't really come around. Yeah. Um, you know, because he was he was a big deal and still is. Um, I actually live near his hometown, and if you go into that area, everything is still short stop diner, short stop gas stations, <laughs> short stop this, short stop that. I mean, granted, they do have the Ironbird Stadium up there. You know, his his stadium, which yeah. is basically a, a miniature. It literally is a miniature version of Camden Yards. Um, yeah, see, he, 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 he's not big with the public, but, uh, my grandmother's also really big, uh, um, uh, really, really good friends with Boog Pal. Um, oh, wow. that's and, a name uh, that no one and, really hears anymore. Yeah. Well, he, he still hangs out at Camden Yards. He's got a barbecue stand and, uh, he, he's, he's still there. Anybody that goes to Camden Yards can go and, and just go meet him. Oh, yeah. But, you know, I, I grew up knowing all these guys and, and you know, um, my friend Troy ended up working in film. So I got to meet a lot of celebrities and uh, um, I don't know, I've just gone to concerts and gone to stand ups and just shot my shot to meet people. I've met Patton Oswalt. I've met Brian Posehn a few times. Oh, there you go. Um, I met Maria Bamford before she was popular. I love um, Maria Bamford. She's like one of those weird comics I still actually do enjoy to hear. Yeah. Yeah, and she's like one of the rare female comedians that actually tells jokes and doesn't just monologue about her vagina. Yep. <laughs> you know? Like, I, I love that her one comedy special she did was just in front of her parents. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what, this is it's so stupid, but I loved it so much. It's like, I, I love those ones when the comics actually get creative with, like, their little specials. So yeah. So that, that, that definitely is one of them. But, uh, you know, you know, man, like I said, it's just like, truly this has been very wonderful and awesome and i i really hope that a lot of people like uh enjoyed this too and learned a bunch of stuff because I, I always learn stuff from these little little podcasts with people and uh, i i love doing it i can't wait to have more and more people on you know yeah i just i feel like one day like uh you know when when my wife and i finally have kids it'll be like they'll, they'll go back and they might watch some of this stuff and be like wow well, uh, our dad was kind of an idiot yeah it's like and then it's it's just uh it's just when you were talking about Johnny Unitas, it's like, ah, I understand now where your grandma got her haircut from, Johnny Unitas. Right, exactly. <laughs> it was well, John Madden, it was Johnny Unitas. Yeah, if she had the Johnny Unitas, though, she would have been ahead of her time. <laughs> you know. uh, but uh, I think that's a good point to start wrapping up the show. Um, I just want to go out with my monologue, as always. Um, thank you, everyone, for showing up again. Uh, I do appreciate everyone that comes out to listen to uh, this dumb, cringy bastard speak for hours and sounding like a fool but that's why i bring on some interesting people to try to offset my horribleness um you didn't you gave me something that's more valuable than money you've given me your time and this one has definitely been a a little bit on the longer side it's almost going on to three and a half hours now hey to quote hans mole man i would have just wasted it anyway (laughs) but that's also another thing too you you may have wasted it and you won't be getting that back. And that's still something that's very precious, you know? That's true. And I don't take that for granted. I say this every time at the end of the stream, it sounds scripted, it sounds fake and it sounds gay. But at the same time, uh, I, I really do mean it. You know, it is nice to see people from discords come out, say hi, even if it's just like a hi, just staying here for a few minutes to say hi, give you a view just for support. It's, it's still something. And uh, wonderful guest tonight. Mr. Zero, Extra Zero, the man with a million memes, the man with many s- stories. And this is probably just even just scratching the surface. We have to do this again. We have to uh, sit down and play a game. And like yeah, I said, absolutely. like I said, I, I do appreciate it. And uh, thank you again for coming. Uh, so with that, everyone, please have a great night. And uh, we will be back next Friday, either playing Dave the Diver continuing or something else. I don't know yet. But until then. 
Have a great one.